Oh, that's right. Okay. Oh, now we are. Okay. Good evening, and welcome to this evening's study session of the City Council. Agendas for study sessions, including concept or views, can be found by visiting Broomfield's website at broomfield.org. The public agenda this evening includes one concept review and two study session items. Members of the public may attend tonight's meeting and future council meetings in person at the George DeSiero City and County Buildings Council Chambers located at 1 Decomb Drive or watch live on Channel 8 and through live streaming on Broomfield's website. The public may also participate in public comment on uh, the concept review item only, either in person or by calling 855-695-3744 and pressing star 3 to be placed in the queue for comment. Public comment will be limited to 90 minutes total per item and the individuals attending in person will speak first. The first 1 through 15 participants in the queue have three minutes to speak. The next 16 through 25 have two minutes, and if time remains, the next 26 plus in the queue have one and a half minutes to speak. If joining in person, we'll ask for you to come to the podium and state your name and neighborhood for the record. Tonight's concept review is a proposal for proposed mixed-use development at Sheridan Parkway and Colorado 7. We'll follow the city's standard procedures for concept plan reviews. First, the staff will present a summary of the application. Following the staff summary, the applicant will make their presentation. We'll then take comments from members of the <coughs> Land Use Review Commission and other interested advisory boards, followed by public comment. Then the applicant will have an opportunity for final comments and finally questions and comments from City Council. Electronic copies of concept review plans are available at broomfieldvoice.com. Copies of comments provided for each plan at broomfieldvoice.com have been provided to City Council and can be found by clicking the correspondence link at the bottom of tonight's agenda. Council members have a copy of the agenda memorandum for this proposal which I'll ask our staff to summarize. I'm just going to keep, there you go, thank you. Mayor and Council and Community, Brandon Rowe, Principal Planner, will walk us through um, this concept review. Anna Bertanzetti is also here with us, um, Co-Director of um, Planning and Economic Vitality, um, is also here, and I do see the applicant in the audience. Um, we'll, we'll hear from them in just a moment on, um, on, the, on the Center City District. Mr. Rowe. Thank you, Madam Chair Hoffman. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. Uh, Brandon Rowe, Principal Planner. Uh, could you get the next slide, please? Uh, the project is located on the southeast corner of Sheridan Parkway in Colorado 7. We have a drone video uh, of the project area. Could we please play that video? The video starts looking out eastward towards I-25 along Colorado 7 uh, from the northwest corner of the project. The video pans towards the southeast and you can see the project area in the foreground and other areas of North Park in the background. As the video pans southwards, you are also able to see ongoing site work for the area known as the East Village, uh, which is currently in progress. The video continues to pan over the single family and multifamily residential units within the North Park development located in West Sheridan uh, neighborhood, which is on the west side of Sheridan Parkway. Prospect Ridge Academy is also in the background. The video continues panning, and you're able to see the commercial development within Erie, including the King Supers, before panning back across the Highlands development in Broomfield and returning to the starting point of the video. Uh, this is Highlands as you're looking at it. And that concludes the video. Thank you. The next map that'll show up is gonna be an excerpt of the comprehensive plan 
Uh, the project is designated mixed use commercial in the 2016 comprehensive plan and the proposed development is consistent with the development anticipated for those areas. Next slide, please. The applicant's conceptual site plan is depicted on this slide. The applicant's proposing a mixed use district with the majority of uses being horizontally mixed. Uh, there is some limited vertical stacking within portions of the site. Overall, the center street is currently proposed to consist of 213,000 square feet of retail uh, and restaurant, uh, including 45,000 square feet for a grocer. Uh, 13,100 square feet of makerspace, 380,000 square feet of office, 160,000 of loft office, 80,000 square feet of medical office, a hotel consisting of 180 rooms, and a total of uh, 1,260 residential units, including some active senior living. Um, the property is located on that hard corner of Sheridan and Colorado 7. Um, there are a number of accesses proposed into the site, a number located along Sheridan Parkway, and a limited access along Colorado 7. Um, the conceptual site design would go through a formal traffic study to determine uh, limited motion for all of those accesses. Specific phasing plan isn't proposed at this time, but has his, the developer has historically replatted larger districts within baseline into super blocks, which would develop into individual pieces. A similar process was done for East Village and Southlands recently. There are a number of green spaces interspersed within the development, um, and the site is designed in a manner that puts, it, puts the office on the northeast corner, the commercial through uh, essentially the central core of Center Street District, and the residential along the so southwestern corner to provide a transition to the existing residential to the south. Could I get the next slide, please? This slide provides a conceptual of the site scaling. You can see some proposed building heights, uh, generally ranging from one to five stories. Next slide, please. This map depicts the project boundary and the 2,000 foot buffer from oil and gas facilities. There are no oil and gas facilities or locations within the project uh, boundary itself. However, there are three plugged and abandoned wells within the 2,000 foot buffer. Uh, the Northwest A, Northwest B, Interchange A, Interchange B, and Livingston pad sites are not depicted in the map and are all located more than 2,000 feet from the project area. Next slide, please. The applicant has provided some architectural inspiration images that will guide their development moving forward, but have not provided specific uh, architectural designs for their buildings at this time. And next slide, please. Uh, public hearing notices were completed to the best of staff's uh, knowledge. Signs were placed on the site and mail notices were sent to property owners within 1,000 feet. Staff has identified five, uh, four key issues. Sorry, uh, the first is density and intensity of the development. Uh, this area was anticipated to be the urban core of North Park and a key, key high density area to support the future uh, bus rapid transit area. The development can currently proposes a resident, residential density of 19.55 over the overall area. Um, the PUD eliminated density and intensity gaps, caps for this development, um, and the applicant is not pursuing maximum density or intensity or heights that could be allowed. Uh, the second key issue is financial consideration. The proposed development, due to the scale and mix of residential, local retail, and non-retail commercial, produces a lower than anticipated fiscal impact to Broomfield. The Master Growth and Development Agreement uh, details the revenue contributions to the urban renewal area from Broomfield, the proposed development, which results in an estimated net negative fiscal impact. The developer and staff will work with the, um, sorry, staff will work with the developer moving forward to understand the mix, scale, and timing of Center Street and the larger baseline area within the context of the full multi-decade build out and market conditions. Uh, phasing, the development will be phased per market demand. There is no requirement in the MGDA for non-residential non land uses to occur prior to residential, and specific phasing has not been identified. And finally, the, the final key issue is the gateway and entryway image. As currently designed, the northern and northeastern corner of the site are oriented and designed in a way that places surface and structured parking along that entrance into Broomfield. This concludes staff's presentation. The applicant is here this evening to make a presentation as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
The applicant's presentation is next, and will the applicant's representative please identify themselves for our listeners before beginning your brief presentation this evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Kyle Harris, General Manager of McWinney's Baseline Community. And I believe our design team is going to be driving the applicant's presentation this evening. So when we've got that teed up, we will be ready to go. This is Jeremy Hall with Nelson on the line. Um, can you see my screen now, Kyle? We can. Thank you. If you can put it into presentation mode, that would be great. Excellent. Awesome. If you could move to the next slide, please. All right. So I'm going to offer some comments quickly on context, and then I'm going to turn it over to Jeremy Hall, who you heard is on the line. He's with uh, Nelson, our design team. He will take us through site planning and some 3D perspectives, a little more detail there. Then we're going to hand it over to Jim Nimchek on our horizontal team, who's going to walk us through some infrastructure, phasing, and uh, landscaping and open space comments, uh, an anticipated schedule. And what we neglected to put, the last thing that we wanted to talk about is um, retail and market studies that support um, the plan that you uh, see in front of you. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. So Center Street District, as some of you know, this has been a long time coming. We have multiple iterations of some form of Center Street District, but we're really pleased with where this is landing. Um, Center Street is designed to be the there there for the baseline community. Pedestrian oriented, a place where you can grab drinks, uh, food, work. Um, and as such, uh, this area has a mix of uses, both horizontally mixed use as well as was mentioned some vertical mixed use. The acreage is approximately 63, not including the butterfly pavilion. Some of the imagery you saw previously did not include butterfly and stem, but we want to be very clear that those are critical components to the entire Center Street District area. Next slide, please. Connectivity is incredibly important, and we're going to start with road connectivity. We anticipate two full motion intersections. I don't know if, uh, Jeremy, if you can identify these with your cursor for folks, but one um, at the intersection of Promenade and Highway 7, that's anticipated to be full motion. The other full motion at the intersection of 167th and Sheridan and then right in, right out along Sheridan, and then uh, at, actually that's uh, three... If you move just a little bit north on Sheridan, you get to a right in, right out, and then there's another three quarters intersection. And I mention this because how traffic ingresses and egresses the site has implications for where the retail lays out, where potentially even where the STEM school ultimately locates. From a um, biking perspective, we've put bike lanes on our collector roadways. And then from a pedestrian perspective, connectivity is extremely important. We wanted sort of all pathways to lead to the big star in the middle, which is our central plaza. And so we have connectivity from the park through uh, what we would almost describe, if you're familiar with our East Village neighborhood, we've got gardenways. These are almost the, the urban version of those gardenways that lead into the center area. Also continuing that pedestrian connectivity to what could be the location of the BRT. I think that's still being worked through. And then we also have connectivity from the uh, East Village neighborhood into that area as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jeremy, who will walk through some uh, additional details on the plan. Thank you, Kyle. Um, so as you see here, this is the development plan that was shown um, a little bit ago by the staff. And just to walk through it a little bit more detail, um, you know, number one there in the middle indicates that the town center square and central plaza space, which would be highly activated with um, pedestrian activity and programming, outdoor patio spaces for restaurants, um, and, and very there to create a very energetic and dynamic core for the overall retail development. Um, as we radiate away from the core, uh, on the southwest side, we have blocks of residential um, that are lined with ground level retail along our village edges, um, nesting parking decks in the middle that would be um, shared use for both the retail and for the residential components. And then those residential components would also have private courtyards as you 
um, get a little more toward the perimeter. Again, in the middle, there's some office and commercial uses like stacked again vertically over top of retail um, with a series of integrated green spaces that connect us back to the linear park with this big element that's here to the south. We wanted to provide a lot of connectivity in and draw you in various different ways to the site, as Kyle was talking about, to get to the core. Um, and then again, on the, the very northeast side, there is a, is a commercial anchor, which would have medical office, office, um, and potential other commercial uses that would come along um, as part of that development. Within the retail core, uh, predominantly going to be retail, food and beverage, entertainment type uses. The grocery store anchor is located there on the corner of Sheridan and Highway 7. And then lastly, part of the mesh plan is, is critical is number 16 here is the connectivity to um, the future BRT stop and how we can pull that activity right down into the core of the project. So, you know, if you get off that stop, it's really going to be an inviting entrance into the development and really pull you into the core, into the middle of this mixed use um, vertical development that's here. There's also some park space leading in from um, in from the south where the uh, STEM school and the Butterfly Pavilion are, as well as some shared parking decks there that are used for those different um, uses as well helping us share parking at different peak times for the different uses that are in the district. <clears throat> um, this next image just shows the idea of potentially relocating the STEM school just slightly to the Northeast on the other side of Center Street as an optionality there um, for where that could be located if that would um, prove fruitful for the project, thus freeing up some more internal green space in the linear park um, you know, for that use there in the middle. Um, this slide shows what would be essentially the phase one development, and I think they're going to touch a little bit on this later, but it would include the village, uh, the, the uh, majority of the village retail, uh, residential that has ground level retail integrated in it, the main street environment there, and a lot of the pedestrian and plaza spaces in the middle that are going to create the, very, the activity spaces um, and use areas that we're going to use to activate uh, the retail. And the next thing we're gonna show you is just a couple of perspectives throughout the project, just to kind of show you how this is vertically integrated. Um, it's expanding on some of the stuff that we were shown earlier, but this is a view kind of looking in from, so Center Street is here to your right in this image. You're looking kind of Southwest, uh, the multifamily residential at the back, the Village Green, the plaza here in the middle, law, uh, the office and retail on the left. So really showing how this central space becomes this activity hub that was highly programmable, have different events that are both from a civic standpoint as well as different entertainment uses, really creating a lot of um, revolving activity throughout not only the day but through the year, providing this as a, a really great community space that people come to for a myriad of different events, whether it's just to hang out with family or whether it's to be part of um, some kind of larger event. This is a character image board of just what some of those spaces could be. You know, lots of communal outdoor sitting where you might grab food or drink at a local restaurant but sit out in a patio space. Maybe ways to create some shade structures as passageway spaces throughout. Different ways to incorporate seating into the space uh, as well as, again, different ways to have pedestrian movement through linear parks as well as outdoor um, grottos for sitting. So you can see it's a very vibrant space and it's really about creating that human energy and that human heat within the space that makes it a very exciting um, and active town center. This is again looking in, this is your view from Center Street looking in um, to the village core, um, lots of plaza space kind of inviting you in from the street so it's not just going to be a solid wall of buildings but you know meaningful architecture that's on the road but also allowing you to view into the core um, so that you can see the retail activity and see the human activity that's going on within the space itself. Uh, we'd have lots of opportunities for outdoor dining. These are kind of the spaces that you might see, the ability to inc incorporate heaters, um, you know, again, social spaces where you can sit kind of organically and, and watch people or, or even organized outdoor dining spaces that might have a shade structure or something tied to a specific restaurateur. Uh, this view is kind of flipping back and looking the other way. This is looking northeast. This is the medical office and office in the background, office over retail on your right, and then the town the town green on your left, um, just showing with that space. So it's, it's again, it's even porous so you can see in through it and really see that human activity from all the, the people that work there, live there, they can see into the space and be a part of that activity throughout. Uh, similar kind of views looking in, just seeing the, the, the scale of that space, you know, having three and four and five story buildings anchoring it around, 
and then having buildings in the middle that are appropriately scaled for the type of retail we want to activate the space. Um, this is some of the architectural character that we've talked about, just showing the scale of what those buildings would look like. You know, four and five stories of residential over retail. Um, you know, you've got some residential and hospitality uses in here, different ways to create patios over top of retail space looking down in. So really create some active vertical edges uh, along this uh, retail core. This is a view from kind of the butterfly pavilion looking back in toward the project. Now, this is some maker space that we're using to line the parking deck so that we're not exposing the, the edge of the, the precast deck, but line it with some active maker space that we can use to have a unique courtyard space that's in between the hotel and, and the office as this great outdoor breakout space for the maker space, but connecting you through maybe some moments of art uh, that connects you back into the village core and thus also to the butterfly pavilion to your to the south. And this is some imagery of what that could look like. Again, this is a parking deck with some one-story maker space on it. Um, again, just different ways to activate that ground level. You might have big roll-up doors that are seen in this imagery here, big movable walls, again, to make it where you can open it up and invite people in to see what's being used for that space, but then all close it down and make it private when it needs to be private. And these are some imagery of, of kind of the activity that we're talking about doing in the court. You see, you see, this is just a you know normal day during the week with lots of activity. They've got a cornhole table set up here for people to play. There's a little area for the kids to play. A lot of shared public space that all the restaurants and, and entertainment uses open up onto, but really creates a great um, environment for people to socialize and commune as, as if it's their community living room. Um, so it becomes a really great space. All walks of life can come. You have a stage area here that you can set up for events and really make this a multi-purpose space that can accommodate any kind of programming we can envision now, as well as programming that may come along in the future that we don't even know about today, but make it a flexible space that can accommodate anything we want to be able to do. Um, and this view is showing the connectivity, connectivity from the, um, light, the BRT. Um, so, so this would be the BRT stop the linear park that's along baseline, and then how we're inviting you into the project through um, these different uh, retail and restaurant uses out here on the frontage. These could have two stories with roof decks on them, taking advantage of the views to the mountains, and then really invite you through this promenade walk along the retail, connecting you into the, the, the activity core where the main lawn is. Um, this would be your view as you got off and as, as a ground level view, so you can see the buildings are there to frame your view, outdoor patio spaces, again, the opportunity for roof decks, taking advantage of views. And then again, you have a sight line that goes all the way into the core, um, making that retail very viable and very connected, you know, not only from the frontage, but all the way into that central area that, that is uh, so vital to the success of it. And I'm gonna turn it over back to the team to talk about infrastructure. Good evening, Jim Nimchak here, Vice President of Land Development with McWinney. Um, as I've said out at the dais before, I am kind of more the infrastructure guru of our group. Um, kind of been leading all the efforts of at least the infra infrastructure construction over the last few years. The one thing I would highlight, if we can go to the next slide, um, Kyle covered pretty appropriately the accesses on Highway 7 and Sheridan. The one thing I would ad uh, specifically advance is that we have been prioritizing and targeting infrastructure for this specific region over the last five years. Um, specifically drainage way improvements that span all the way to Highway 7 and Huron Street, um, including the master sewer interceptor that serves this location in East Village. So luckily, and it, as well, the advancement of the Sheridan Parkway four-lane infrastructure that we put in. So luckily, we've got a good base of improvements that will be used to accommodate this use. Um, one thing I would add to Kyle's comment, um, the uh, full access point at 167th is likely to be signalized uh, within the first phase of this development. And there is a phasing plan shown here. Um, the boundaries of this phasing plan are mostly drawn uh, specifically to react to the triggered uses uh, expected at a later time uh, for the STEM school and butterfly region of those locations, as well as timing out a secondary location on Highway 7 for a full access point where Promenade Street intersects with Highway 7. So initially for phase one, uh, it would be served by the uh, 167th signal and the three quarter access location on uh, Highway 7, in addition to that right in, right out that is further north on Sheridan Parkway. If we can go to the next slide. Um, next slide. Uh, this is more uh, specifically, I won't read through the individual line items of this, but this is kind of how we are approaching how we meet our three ten basic tenets of uh, environmental stewardship, healthy living, and fostering innovation within this development. 
and last to schedule. Um, specifically, uh, you can see that there's a fairly good amount of urgency uh, tied to this development schedule when we're looking at a specific May 2023 date to be back in front of council for site development plan and, and uh, subdivision plat approvals. Um, so that is the key piece as we start to engineer and, and design the, the project in the next coming months. And I'll remain if there's any other big questions on overall infrastructure as well for baseline in general. Good evening. Uh, my name is Matt Greenberg. I'm the Director of Design and Construction at McQuinney. Uh, I'm just going to touch on a little summary here of um, some of the points that we've already gone through as well as talk a little bit about the market analysis that we did uh, and the retail. Um, <clears throat> so as an overview, we looked at this um, opportunity and development as um, having great uh, accessibility. Um, the blocks really um, trying to create a human scale there, as Jeremy noted, on a lot of the graphics um, and photos that we showed within the development and, and really looked at this as a, a true mixed use type of development uh, for Broomfield, which we're, we're really excited about. Um, <clears throat> in our process here of looking at all these different product types for the mixed use, we um, did some market analysis um, through office, industrial, uh, multifamily, and, and our retail um, as well to try to understand what the need was um, in this area and, and what we could provide. Um, there was a, a gap analysis that was done <clears throat> actually by Rob, who's on the call as well, uh, Rob Brown, who's with um, the uh, Denver Retail Group. Um, and Rob, can you touch on that a little bit um, for us here in the group um, and just what you found with the gap analysis? Well, maybe Rob, Rob, maybe I'm mute. Um, in any case, um, we looked at the several um, large format retailers within a five to 10 mile radius of this. We won't go into detail of all the different groups, but really tried to take um, a larger look, understanding that retail was critical here for this development. Um, and again, what we could provide in terms of square footage, what the need was in, in terms of product types and things like that, that would fit the design. Um, that Nelson walked through. Um, construction costs were obviously um, are a critical piece today, um, something that we had to consider, um, <clears throat> which were driving rents as well, as everybody knows construction and the market has been a little wild recently. Um, we looked at some of the negative um, effects of office absorption over um, the stretch of COVID um, and trying to understand that so we were putting a good mix and square footage number um, to our office um, over the next several years. And then the multifamily group, looking at the, the population here um, in Broomfield and the, and the demographics that would fit um, with our multifamily development. Um, the last piece of this being the timing um, of the RTD, or sorry, the BRT, this says RTD, but the BRT stop, and understanding that is a critical component, um, as we showed on the slide earlier, um, and how that accesses into the mixed use and retail area, and really drawing um, <clears throat> that opportunity into the center um, of the development. Um, with respect to the actual uh, retail um, study, we concluded that about 170,000 plus or minus um, square feet of the initial phase um, would be something um, that, that we felt like this could handle. Assuming um, four anchors, uh, including a grocery store, that was talked about a little bit before um, <clears throat> within the program. Um, small shop spaces, um, we've, we felt like really contributed to the, the pedestrian scale of this development. Um, and the, again, the grocery would really kick off um, our development in terms of a phasing. So um, that would be the first um, retail product that we see going um, within, within this development. Um, <clears throat> from an office study standpoint, we talked to um, one of our, our market study groups, Ancora, and, and looked at the overall square footages over um, a larger Broomfield, Boulder County area um, in terms of what, what the absorption looked like. And we felt like um, that a 5% capture rate 
um, totaling about 75,000 square feet a year was was appropriate moving forward. And again, this is um, over time. The, the study was done over a 10-year span, and so <clears throat> we're looking at um, that stretch from you know today up through the next 10 years um, and what the office component could handle. Um, and in, in the same vein with the retail, um, we talked to uh, the Concord Group, who really felt like the annual um, demand <clears throat> was plus or minus about 1,100. As you can see, our study shows about uh, 1,200. Um, and so we're right in that sweet spot, uh, we feel like, um, with this first phase of development. Um, next slide, please. I think Kyle's going to talk to us a little bit about some of our future retail opportunity um, that we see. Thanks, Matt. Um, we recognize that the city is undergoing some discussions about its finances and land use and how that relates to the efficacy of city finances. I'm sure it's a difficult conversation. Uh, we do appreciate the importance of retail to the city's finances. Quite frankly, we share that desire to have retail because it helps us out too. Um, so we have zero incentive to underdevelop retail. We are very much in the same boat in this regard, but we also have zero incentive to overbuild that which the market cannot accommodate. And so I just want to make sure that we emphasize the point that what you see here, what we've presented, is essentially a five to 10 year plan based upon a deep dive market study, both on the residential side, on the retail side, and on the office side. This is what we realistically believe the market can accommodate over the next five to 10 years. Now, that having been said, does that mean we're done? that this is all the retail that you're going to get, all the resi in this area that's going to happen? And the answer is we certainly don't think so. We can't tell you what's going to happen after the, the next 10 years. But it was never our intent, and I think we're, we're maybe, or at least me in particular, maybe responding a little bit to some of what we saw in the staff report. It seemed as though there was, hey, this is Broomfield's one bite at the apple, and you guys are coming up short. And I want to let you know that that is not the way we view this. We view this as the first phase of multiple phases of retail and higher density mixed use residential retail office throughout the community. So think about the future retail opportunities as really being in two buckets. One of the buckets is in the existing Center Street District that you see right there. There is flexibility enough to, if the market tells us, where we could develop additional retail, whether it's literally a pop in the top on existing, whether it is having more retail at grade under future um, office or other development, or whether it's even conversion of surface lots into uh, structured parking. Maybe, hopefully, but that is far enough out that we can't present that right now. We need to start with what we believe is financially doable. So that was one bucket, Center Street District. The other bucket are these areas that are in these ovals that are to the east and also on Highway 7. We view those as opportunities for future mixed use inclusive of retail areas. So just wanted to make sure that it was clear that we weren't presenting this as this is the end all be all because there are, we believe, there will be more opportunities in the future. Matt's going to close this out. Thank you. So I think in closing, first, we just wanted to thank everyone for the opportunity here um, to present uh, the project. We're really excited about this um, opportunity and the whole development, something that we're passionate about here at McQuinney. Um, and we feel like that, that this plan is really market driven. Um, we've, we've thought through it from the market analysis standpoint. It's flexible, as Kyle just mentioned, from a future expansion point, which we know is, is critical for Broomfield um, and for the citizens here. Um, we feel the, the retail piece is realistic, but not over aggressive, um, understanding that you know, empty retail does nobody any good. So we wanna create the, the right product, the right square footage um, that we can fill, um, and then we know um, the community can use. 
Um, it's financeable and constructible as well. So um, those, all those key points, we feel like it hit all the sweet spots and really bring a lot of um, great space and, and value to the city of Broomfield. And we're just excited to have the opportunity to, to give back to, to Broomfield just as it's given to us and um, those of us who live up and around the area um, as well. So we, we think that that's important. So thank you everybody for your time. Thank you very much. Next, are there any uh, members of the Land Use Review Commission present who would like to comment? Any online? I don't see any. Are there any other boards and commission members who'd like to comment on this proposal? Seeing none. Public comments are next. As mentioned earlier, the public may comment both in person or on the phone. If you're joining on the phone and want to be placed in the queue for comment, please call 855-695-3744 and press star 3. If you're joining in person, please come to the podium and public comments will be limited to the time limits outlined earlier. Not anybody? Oh, oh, thank you, Mr. Robinson. <laughs> yeah, my name is Marty Robinson. I lived in Anthem Ranch on the north end of Moonfield for about 15 years. I'm particularly curious about the residential stuff. It seems much more extensive than I was to understand from past experience. And information, and uh, maybe uh, McLenny could, or the planners could elaborate a little more on the nature of the residential and uh, the mix and so on. And uh, maybe it's too early in a concept review, but something like 1,200 residential uh, residences in this development seems like a lot compared to what my understanding was about how much commercial and uh, and uh, retail was going to be here and its strong uh, influence on our tax revenues. Thank you. Anyone else? Would the applicant, applicant would you like to address that, Mr. Harris? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, as far as overall residential, we do have a total of, I think it's 9,205 units of residential density that's for the entire baseline area. And we are attempting to deploy that intelligently across baseline where it makes sense. So areas of higher density, which you'll see in the baseline plan, so that some of the residential, sorry, in the Center Street District plan, so some of those areas where you see residential um, it is of much higher density. I think we're somewhere in the neighborhood between 60 and 70 DUs per acre, which does two things. It helps with the efficacy of the retail in that area. Secondly, it also is helpful, as I think staff mentioned, in support of BRT, um, which we hope is going to happen, but the reality is it may still be a few years down the road. Um, relative to the amount of retail, and what the impact of that will be on city finances. Again, I can only repeat what we said earlier. It would help us out financially if the market was there for more retail, we could build it. But all we can do is build what the market is telling us we can do responsibly. And that's what this plan shows. And again, as Broomfield continues to build, as hopefully the um, this community, this particular area, Center Street, begins to thrive, hopefully that activity begets activity and we can have the opportunity to add more into this specific area. But we have to start somewhere and we think this is the responsible way to start. Can you please clarify for me, Mr. Harris, the, the, the gold lots, I don't know what page in your presentation that was, but the residential um, pads, are they first floor retail or are they just all residential? Um, do, let's see. I don't know if uh, our if Jeremy would be able to share by any chance the presentation because there are some instances where there is retail at grade, other instances where there are not. It's a bit of a mix. Um, but the idea, 
It's on page 10 of the memo, that map, if that helped. Yeah. That's it. Okay, Jeremy, maybe if you could trace with your cursor where the retail at grade was anticipated. So, sure. Um, so we've got um, all along this edge here, along these blocks would be retail. So engaging with the retail that's in the village, uh, we have retail on the corner here in phase one. And then, you know, you, we have ground floor expandability of the retail as we continue on down toward promenade. So um, phase one would be retail all along this edge um, as it faces into the village. And then it would be residential to grade on the outward edges where it is facing other residential to grades there. And what? Jeremy, in phase two, I believe we also had retail at grade beneath the office, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Yeah, both sides of this street here, you know, could be future built out as retail to extend all the way down to the Butterfly Pavilion and the promenade access. So we could gain frontage here and we could gain retail frontage along that section as well. And I think also across from the plaza, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, these buildings are already programmed for that. So the, as these buildings get built out, they would uh, certainly have retail in it as part of their um, their construction. And then these buildings down here would have the ability to convert and or get built with retail as they come online in the future. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that clarification. I didn't mean to jump the line. Um, so next are council questions and comments. Uh, any member of council have any questions or comments? Council Member Ward, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, maybe up your volume a little bit. Sorry, I'll try speaking louder. <clears throat> um, so I guess my first question is for the applicant. Um, in regards to the um, the density issue, it was mentioned in our memo that we had waived all, I guess, limitations on density. And from how it was made out to us, uh, you guys are kind of underperforming on what we thought we were receiving with density in terms of you haven't maxed out the height limit, you haven't maxed out the number of units, et cetera. Um, could you speak to me on why that decision really was made? Were you able to decipher that? Because I really, it was hard. You're a little garbly, Council Member Ward. It's probably the spotty Wi-Fi. Remember this next time we decide to do a hybrid with half the council in the mountains. <laughs> Between Anna and myself, we're going to see if we can restate the question. I think it had to do with um, what was the decision making criteria behind the amount of density that we are deploying in Center Street, given that we have perhaps more density available, but have not chosen to deploy it? Is that a reasonable, is that kind of sort of right? Yes. Okay, good. So, so what we are reflecting in Center Street right now, if we had that image back up, you will notice that there were some um, gray boxes in the middle of the, retail, of the um, residential. That is structured parking. We have, we're quite frankly, pushing the financial envelope right now just to be able to get that type of residential going because um, the folks who run the pro formas will tell you you need to be at a certain uh, rental rate before you can actually afford that type of construction. So what we're doing is at this point in time, we are trying to push the envelope and achieve as much density as we think we can do in a financially underwritable, prudent way. Uh, without, Would we love to be able to do mid-rise higher than this? Yes, but we're just not at a point where the rental rates justify that. So we thought that this was pushing the envelope a bit, but perhaps um, not so much that it became unfeasible. I hope that answers the question. 
Did you get that council member award? Yes, I did. Thank you. Um, I guess my next question then is maybe a mixture of staff and um, the applicant as well. In regards to the BRT side, um, I know it was shown on the screen that the uh, eastern direction is stopped right there at um, the baseline project. Why are we going to get the other people from the west down direction across the street in a safe manner? Um, are we going to do kind of an underpass, which I think would be the safest option for that particular corridor? Are we going to make them go to another street or crossover? Uh, I don't know what's the plan there. Thank you, Council Member Ward. <laughs> This is Anna Bertanzetti, co-director for community development. We missed a little bit of the last part of your question, but I believe the first part was around the bus rapid transit station. We're currently working with CDOT stakeholders in the area to determine some of the priorities around the location decisions for the bus rapid transit stations along Colorado 7. It obviously is very helpful to have development partners that are looking already at where locations could work with their future development. Um, this is not a final location, but it is certainly helpful to have development that is planned with the bus rapid transit station in mind. So as was mentioned by council member Ward, this would be for the eastbound location. If this were to be chosen as the final decision, another location for the westbound lanes would be needed in the Highlands development on the north side of Colorado 7. It has not been determined whether those would need to have a grade separated crossing and whether that would be above or below grade. That's part of the decisions or the things that we're looking at right now as we look through the locations and the appropriateness and prioritizing where the best location could possibly be. But as I think Council Member Ward was mentioning, um, being able to cross from one side to the other is very important. And so those factors will need to be considered if it is not at an intersection. Council Member Ward, does that help to address some of your question? If I miss some, please let me know. Yes, it does. Um, I will work on some tech stuff right now on my um, Could you repeat that? Can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay. I called in with my phone, so we're just going to do it this way. Um, yes, Anna, that does answer my question um, with regards to the BRT. Uh, my next questions, I guess. Hold on. Um, with regard to the um, kind of the layout of where we've put commercial, residential, the whole office space, um, why have we decided to flank all of baseline, well not all of baseline, but a majority of baseline with surface level parking and not try and bring that in so it's wrapped around by residential or what well, commercial in this particular case. Are you saying that the invert so that the parking lots are interior to the yeah. street? Okay. You don't see them. Got it. Uh, Council Member Ward, I'm going to ask uh, Jeremy Hull on our design team perhaps to address that. Right. So, um, you know, a little bit of the me methodology for that is in order to create, it's kind of a twofold answer in the fact that in order to create the most successful village um, heartbeat that we can, we need that completely surrounded by buildings and architecture and vertical integrated mixed use to make that as active as we can. And then we're using, we are using landscape to kind of integrate with it. But part of the methodology for leaving or, or having in phase one surface lots is so that over time we can come back and build density 
um, that could be here on the frontage and take advantage of that frontage being out there. If we, if the retail was all lined along um, baseline, it would all be very highway oriented and not have a lot of um, cross energy with any of the other uses on the site. So it's a little bit of about creating enough um, mass and energy with the buildings in the middle, as well as creating pads where we can then take advantage, as Kyle mentioned, when we have you know future opportunity for vertical development um, we can redevelop those surface lots into buildings and create more of a building wall that's more vertically um, integrated along the edges of baseline as time goes along. Okay, thank you. So just to clarify, is your intent with some of that open surface level parking lots to repurpose it in the future for other purposes like residential, commercial, office, et cetera? Yeah, they're, they are designed so that we could redevelop those lots vertically um, over time. So, you know, if we have the ability to go structured parking and densify, they are of a scale and, and um, in position where we could do that and still be accreted to the, the village core that's there in, in phase one. Okay, thank you. Um, my last question that I'm going to have is in regards to the timing of the build out, because I know we do not have an agreement between you, you and the city that uh, commercial has to be built at certain milestones. Can you talk about what your intent is with how you're going to develop the commercial alongside the residential time-wise? We are looking to have the majority of the retail done in the first phase of Center Street District. So if you'll recall the, and maybe we can put the phasing diagram up. That's the area that as best we can tell right now would be the first phase. So it would include the three residential blocks that you see there. I can't say definitively that it will be all of the retail there, but what we need to do is we have to generate enough AV in this project so that we can ultimately go to the bond markets, issue bonds, and put in the infrastructure to support this. So there's almost a built-in incentive for us to get a certain critical mass done in order to make the project work. So I would say those, uh, really, the stuff that you see in that red drawing reflects, you know, give or take a few of the retail buildings, what we would hopefully be able to bring forward as a comprehensive phase one. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, that are all my questions for the time being. Well, thank you. I miss you keeping time for me. Um, I forgot. So next we'll go to Council Member Marsh Holshen. Thank you, Mary. Can you hear me? Yes, then the clock is yeah. ticking. <laughs> uh, my question for the applicant is going to go um, along with Council Member Ward's questions regarding the surface par parking. Um, I understand what you're talking about regarding the um, economic factors, but I guess my, my, my question is, what is the timeline possibility cost of switching that out if for like structure parking is that something that's feasible at this point um i understand what you were saying before but um this is Matt Greenberg. Um, so is the question from a cost perspective of surface versus structured? Just so well, I, I I mean, yes, but I guess my, from my perspective and from what we're looking at, we're trying to build a sustainable, and I know you are too, a sustainable community for, for Broomfield. And surface level parking, besides being unseemly and not, not the most aesthetically pleasing, um, it also increases, you know, surface level parking increases runoff, it increases... Uh, surface temperatures and so structure parking to me seems to be more sustainable long term. So, 
So I guess my question is, what what would keep you from doing surface uh, structure parking at this point? I mean, really, cost is the major factor with structure parking. I mean, uh, um, structure parking, as you can imagine, um, well, rather, surface parking, um, there is so much less structure. Um, currently, uh, <clears throat> a surface, um, or sorry, a structure parking spot um, that is above grade could run twenty to thirty thousand dollars a stall. I mean, those are big numbers. So five thousand, um, you know, versus thirty thousand a stall. So we're talking um, big dollars in terms of of just the overall cost to the construction. That would be the the major factor. That does make sense. Um, so along the line of the, of the service parking that you're doing, what are your factor? What are you doing to mitigate things like runoff, um, for example? You know, that's something we would work with our um, civil and landscape team on um, and, and our consultants to to dive deeper into that. Uh, I think it's today um, at Concept, those are things we're just starting to think about, but very important to us from a sustainability standpoint and um, trying to main, you know think about those factors um, as we're putting drainage and things like that in uh, as well. And as have, you considered, have you considered things like surface level parking but covering the salt some of the salts with for example solar um having you know we've seen com some communities in some cities do you know you have surface parking but you have it covered with but, but you put solar on top of that covering yeah we have um, started to look into um solar arrays and working with some solar groups um to put that um thought into into play as well so those are things we are thinking about absolutely and from an aesthetic point of view um what and I know we're not really talking to landscaping too much yet, but as far as off Highway Seven to the um, service level parking, so I mean part of the part of the gateway image that we're trying to present, you know, you can see a giant parking lot that doesn't really portray that what we're looking for. So, is there going to be landscaping in between the road to mask some of that, or maybe is there an opportunity for some sort of one one small stretch of retail in front in between the road and the, and the service level parking, or Something along those lines. Yeah, we've got a buffer zone, obviously off Highway Seven. That would all be landscaped, and I don't know if you Jim, want to address sure. that in more detail, but um, that's absolutely off the plan. Yes, the the, the the buffer zone on Sheridan is very strictly um, regulated right now with the PD. Um, there is an 80 foot buffer, and it does include both uh, vertical integration of berms and uh, high high and level landscaping as well. Okay. And then my last question is regards to the um, the density. I mean, I, obviously, I understand the economic conditions right now, but we really need ra bus rapid transit in this area. And um, one of the concerns brought by staff was that this doesn't quite meet the density level that we need. And my question is, um, as far as building height, is that something that we could do better on if we build higher, um, or is um, or along the lines of parking, um, you know, we have parking currently have parking um, minimums in Brookfield. Is that something that if you thought you could get away with less parking, could you add more density? I love where you're headed with less parking. <laughs> um, but in all in all fairness, I think um, yes, if we were able to go more vertical, we would be able to achieve greater levels of density. I think the challenge becomes as you go more vertical, and there are other people who know this much better than I do as a land guy, um, you do into different construction types and the costs of construction increase markedly. And then you still, you're going vertical. It also means there's gotta be more structured parking in order to support it. Is that the vision long-term for this place? Absolutely it is. Again, I think the financials are just such that it, we're, we're just not quite there yet. And the wrap product is really, is. is I think that's at this moment in time as much as we can push the density envelope on the apartments. Okay. And then Kyle, can I add something really quickly to answer um, Councilmember Marsh Holden's question, maybe a different way that also addresses um, Marty Robinson's question in terms of density directly adjacent. What we're trying to do is sort of blend the density from the three to four um, story buildings directly west of um, Oh my goodness! Um, 
the, the corner of of Sheridan. Sorry, my apologies. Um, so that it, it it kind of blends up and turns a density that you don't want these giant canyons of residential buildings directly adjacent to three and four story buildings. We need to sort of blend our way into that density so that it doesn't feel overbearing in the neighborhood. Thank you, Mark. And just for the record, it's Mark Lawrence, also with Nelson Design Group. Thank you, Carl. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. I just, um, from my perspective, I obviously um, would like to see less surface parking. Um, I, for one, support higher density, um, higher building height if, if needed, and less parking. So um, that's my perspective on it, and that's all the questions I had right now, um, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Council Member Hankel. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you all for um, putting up with this hybrid meeting. Hopefully you can hear me and uh, we can run this meeting smoothly. Uh, thank you, uh, McWinney and Kyle Harris for, for your presentation. Um, and I really appreciate just this conversation. Um, in Ward 5, we really look forward to this development and what this looks like for the city and county of Broomfield. I have two main questions. Um, one of the main questions for me, uh, I'm big into metro districts and I, it raised a huge red flag for me as far as our staff's concerns about the four key issues. And one of them was the metro districts not having enough support, you know, possibly in bonding and then our financial future for density. Um, I also have concerns about the buffer zone for that gateway image. You guys mentioned, you know, um, landscaping which is fine but that's not a gateway image a gateway image is what are what are the structures that are really bringing people into broomfield and then my second question so my first question is i would like for staff to elaborate on the four key issues that they put in our uh, memorandum and then our second one is you know kyle i appreciate your approach to this and i actually appreciate that you, you that you read our memo not a lot of developers actually read our memos and so um can you explain what you mean by popping the top on commercial so we can do that on residential right and we can do that privately what does that mean for you to do it publicly had you have experience in this area what's the precedence for this uh can we have that in writing i mean eventually we need to get you know all of this commercial as far as um if we can find the market value in this commercial in this area in writing that's where i really think the rubber hits the road so first staff questions and then mcwinney thank you Thank you, council member. Um, so the four key issues, uh, the one that you mentioned first, I'll start with, that's the gateway and entry image. Um, as, as discussed in the memo, um, the current design, the northern and northeastern corner of the site, that's where the office is proposed. Um, and as uh, council member Ward and Marsh Holstrom mentioned, there is a surface parking there, which is the entry. Um, and the oriented orientation and design uh, places that surface and some structured parking along the street frontages as opposed to the buildings being um, oriented closer to Colorado 7 corridor. Um, the, the views are less aesthetically pleasing um, than if it would reorient, reorientate the, the site to bring those buildings closer to the frontage. Um, the, the other key issues that were identified, um, phasing, um, we've discussed that uh, to, to a degree so far of, of not knowing when residential versus non-residential will come and not having any obligations in the MGDA to require that commercial development first. Um, and staff identified that as a key issue uh, since commercial is such a, a key element of baseline moving forward. Um, uh, financial considerations, um, the, the development due to the, the scale and the mix um, it's less than we expected, so that net negative fiscal impact is anticipated, um, at least with that first phase of development. As as Kyle um, has explained, there's there's the potential to to see a future phase in future density or intensity, but as currently proposed, that's a, a negative uh, fiscal impact um, as determined. And then the the other key issue was the density and intensity of the development. Uh, this is a core um, corridor for BRT. Um, and there is there is a need for uh, higher density to support and justify that BRT in the future. Um, the the gross density is the 19.55 acres or dwelling units per acre. Um, that's the residential over the overall 
Center Street District, so approximately 63, 65 acres. Um, when we look at that density of just the area where the residential is contained, that's upwards of 70 dwelling units per acre. Um, but when we, when we look at the density as, as a whole, um, it's not as high as we would like or desire to support BRT moving forward. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, and then also the metro districts. I, I have a real issue with, you know, possibly maybe the metro districts not, not being able to support, you know, the infrastructure. We do rely a lot on those metro districts. So can someone speak to the metro districts issue? Yeah, I'm going to ask Jeff Rowan to speak to that. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, I believe, I don't know where he is, but Mayor, uh, members of council, uh, City Manager Hoffman. I'm Jeff Romine, I'm the Director of Economic Vitality. Um, so what that concern is about and what, what, what Brandon um, started with the answer, and that is, is there, there's an overlaying set of financing that's going on within this development. When we brought this project through in 2021 with the, in 2021 with the, the uh, MGDA agreement, one of the things we looked at was the bond runs that the developer had proposed at that time. That's how we got to the development scale that we're talking about, which is roughly 6 million square feet to 7 million square feet of commercial uh, with the 9205 uh, housing units. Within that, then, metro districts generally are financed through property tax. And so, as you all know from the various conversations we've had, the way that residential property tax it, it becomes available is through the assessment rates as well as the mill rates um, and part of the metro district is those mills. So we recognize that the, the strength of the development from a residential standpoint toward it, yet at the same time most of the value that comes through various metro districts comes through the commercial side uh, in this particular case. They have different mill rates within the metro districts within this area. If you recall there are a number of metro districts divided across across the entire uh, geography of the 1,100 acres. So our concern that, that were expressed in the memo is exactly how that development comes forward. We do have a vesting agreement that talks about 1,700, or uh, I'm sorry, 1.7 million square feet of commercial coming at a particular time, and then it grows up to 20, 2.6 million square feet, and then eventually gets up to what we hope is the six to seven. So it's about timing, as Brandon uh, represented to you all. Um, it's also about making sure that that balance between commercial and residential comes through, um, because that's what helps finance the Met District. It also what helps finance the underlying uh, TIF districts, and it supports both the city um, through our, our funding in order to provide incentive into this uh, through the, the TIF district. So it's a balance and a timing issue that we're talking about. Um, as we continue to work with McWinney, uh, both around baseline as a whole, but around Center Street, it's understanding exactly how that flows through and the given timing. As Kyle represented uh, in his comments, as well as McWinney has shared, um, the Center Street is considered to be an eight to 10 year development cycle um, or, or project. Um, there are other elements within the, the baseline area that will contribute to those base to the um, metro districts, which will help support the infrastructure uh, that they have talked about, whether it be the roadways or some of the, the uh, open spaces and parks and all the other things. So um, we don't have specific answers, um, as you can kind of tell. Uh, council member, what we have is, is a bit of a conversation going on and recognizing that perhaps this was not quite as strong as we expected it to be um, from, the re from the retail side, and therefore there is some underlying concerns about the finance. Um, I hope that answers your question. I will look to the city county manager to see if she wants to amplify anything I said. Um, she always tells me that sometimes I go on too long and I tell you how to make the watch or tell you how to make the watch as well as tell you the time. I'll let her just tell you the time. Your, your microphone's Lord, off. Really? Okay, everybody mark this down. No. <laughs> I can't hear. Your mic wasn't on, Jen. Uh, virtual meeting. I still cannot. Is that better? That's better. So in, uh, oh, okay. 
Or maybe not. I thought that was Jennifer speaking. Yep, I'm gonna try one more time. Um, Mr. Romine, in, in addition to council member Hinkle, and I, and I think um, um, Mr. Harris may have referred to it earlier, what's the, what's the synthesis between a metro district and bond financing? Um, and so when, as, as we move forward at those bond financing, um, Mr. Harris can probably answer this question as well. So we've had a lot of conversations in Broomfield about metro districts. Um, the reliance on metro districts in Broomfield, um, I don't know comparatively for any other communities, but we know um, that uh, for, for our developments, we became heavily reliant on metro districts. Metro districts essentially allow um, a community to build infrastructure, which we all know is the most uh, expensive part of, of, of any development, is, is that initial foundation. And rather than the city and county picking up the tab or the developer picking up the tab, um, Broomfield began to become reliant on metro districts. It's not good or, or, or bad. Um, you can have a great metro district um, that is communicative um, and pays for what it's supposed to pay for, and then it ends. Um, you can have other metro districts that um, change the rates and change the rates quick without a lot of uh, communication. So it's just like a developer. It's not, they're not good. They're not bad. Um, some are better than others. Our reliance on these metro districts um, is 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 something that we will that we will wrestle with um, and, and, until and after we reach build out. Briefly, Jeff, tell us what that connection is between having a metro district to develop what we have to develop in order to get what we want. Right? It's that chicken or the egg piece, and when you go out for bonds when they see what that revenue stream is from the metro districts, how if you don't produce what that metro district is anticipating, how does that impact the financing of those bonds? Um, thank you, uh, Manager Hoffman. And I, I will begin to try to answer that um, in a short manner. And then Kyle's here if he wants to add something to it. Um, in, in short, the way the metro district works um, and the way the financing temp works is obviously you have to pay for a road before you can build it, um, or at least pay as you go. Um, it, it's oftentimes, and just using that as a simple example, but n many of the things that Jim talked about that his role is to provide into the to baseline area is to fund those infrastructure um, uh, projects and to produce them and actually develop, build them. And so oftentimes you want to have that revenue. The way that the revenue works is, is obviously the markets look to see what is being developed. They estimate what that tax revenue is going to be. Um, it's oftentimes a, a bond council that will do that work. And then they determine exactly how they'll be able to issue the bonds. And so it'll affect the interest rate. It'll also affect the time duration of when those, of how long it takes to pay those bonds back. So those two things are the financing side. So the stronger the development, the stronger the revenue that's coming through the development will affect the bond rates, will affect the bond interest, and will be able to make those projects move forward in a rapid manner. So if something doesn't develop in the manner that was anticipated, it will affect those and possibly cause the Met District and, the, and the, the properties within the Met District, if it's property tax, to require a longer period of time for repayment to the bonds. So that's the short of it. That's effectively what we're concerned about, is making sure that balancing and that timing work out to match up with what we anticipated when you approved the MGDA in 2021. Um, there is, it's never perfect. Um, these are forecasts, um, but nevertheless, that's how you kind of work through it. And so that's the dilemma that we're always facing. Um, as Kyle and the McWinney team has pointed out, market demand sets it up. Um, and if market demand changes, then it affects how the development will come forward and thus affect the revenue that the Met District is relying upon in order to pay for the infrastructure that's required. I think that answers and brings across all the points. 
I think so. You know, in a qualitative way, I, I would like to know in a quantitative way what that actually looks like. I know we're, we're looking at, you know, forecasting, but forecasting still has numbers. Um, so I, I do have concerns about that. And I just want to reiterate that to uh, Kyle and your team to, to really take seriously these four key issues. And one of those key issues is not having enough support in those metro districts um, and that gateway image. And of course, my last question, of course, was to you for McWinney to explain, you know, your experience in, in popping the top on commercial. What would, what would really be that trigger for you? Because we see so many times that developers come in and they have this commercial and residential and there's really no incentive for them to come back and really help us, you know, develop that commercial. So we can take all these promises, but I would like to see it in writing if you don't mind. Well, where to begin? Um... Let's start with the pop the top piece first. Uh, so that was a comment that was actually made by um, our uh, retail uh, consultant. Um, and I think what was referenced there, and I want to be careful not to overstate it, uh, we were thinking about that more in terms of thinking about a food and beverage type of operation where you have an upstairs that has a uh, um, second floor deck overlooking the uh, outside area. Historically, second floor retail is more difficult to make work. So it's not like everything. Is that Rob who just joined us? Rob, I'm just going to totally let you take that one then. <laughs> and then we'll get back to more of the financial pieces because a, a lot of good discussion on the financial. But Rob, if you don't mind taking the, the, the question about the retail. Oh, but, but before you do, one comment I did want to make. Uh, because McWinney is traditionally a long-term holder of real estate, uh, we own these assets typically long-term. And therefore, if there is an opportunity to continue to monetize and improve upon the financials, that is our incentive as opposed to building it, flipping, getting out of the uh, ownership of it. So with that, I'll pass it over to Rob. Thanks, Kyle. Good evening, everyone. And to address uh, Councilwoman Henkel's uh, last question about popping the top, that is a figurative term that really talks about or really focuses on the impetus that we would have to expand the retail footprint based upon performance. So as you can see, and as has been mentioned, uh, the, the amount of square footage that we have provided at this point is based upon market demand. And to give a little bit of color, um, I have had a lot of experience working in Northern Colorado uh, with various developers on retail from uh, Mace Rich and the Flatiron Mall, from Four City to creating uh, the Orchard Town Center, even further north into Loveland and Longmont with various redevelopments, uh, Twin Peaks Mall and Centera with McWinney, et cetera. So we have a great understanding of the, the path of residential growth that correlates to the retail demand and absorption, not only in the, the amount of square footage, but the time it takes to absorb that square footage. So part of the reason why you see a number or a uh, quantity of retail that is a little different than anticipated is because of that current demand. And so as we look at performance going forward, there's two thoughts is, well, if we build more, but the vacancy rate is higher than desired, or do we build something that is conservatively aggressive, if you will, uh, that we know will have a strong attendance so the community will get behind it and support it. We increase the frequency of visits that ma then makes the, retail, the retailers themselves uh, perform at a higher rate the sooner we can get to high-performing uh, retailers, which translates into high sales and high you know, tax uh, taxation, we then are in a better financial position to say that we could then theoretically pop the top or expand the retail footprint, which goes back to the initial question that one of the members of council mentioned uh, in this uh, meeting earlier this evening with regards to surface parking, you know, is it unsightly or is there too much of it? Our complete desire is to meet demand right where it is. And if there's an opportunity that's demonstrated by the high performance of retail or food and beverage, we absolutely want to take advantage of the fluidity in the site plan and find areas that can complement what's already been built. 
so that we can maximize the present opportunity that might be, you know, a few years from now, uh, as we've all understand uh, understood forecasting that today is difficult, but it will be evidenced by the high sales performance. So our intention is to maximize retail wherever we can. If we can get into a format where going multiple stores on retail, uh, we will do that. It's hard to predict when that's going to be or who those users for second and third story retail would, retail would be. But in terms of the ground floor, we definitely believe that we can activate that space in the community format that has been presented so far. Okay, thank you. Um, I appreciate the answers. I do love the fact that we have intentions here and that's what I'm hearing, which is fine. Um, but intentions don't mean anything down the road if we don't have anything in writing. And so I appreciate uh, the intentions, but I would like to see something in writing. Uh, maybe there's some sort of trigger mark that we have so that our metro districts you know, aren't bearing the burden of, of this internal development. Um, so I do have concerns about the four key issues that staff has. Um, and then we need some sort of something in writing with our commercial to have some sort of market trigger. And I don't know what those quantitative analysis could be in the market, um, but I think it's really important to have that in writing. So I appreciate your work and I appreciate your guys' study on this. Um, and I appreciate your, your integrity in this. And we expect that um, from McWinney. Thank you. All right, next we have council member Lim. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, the statement that was just made by the applicant that one of the applicants um, said that, you know, we don't want giant canyons. We don't want it to look overbearing. Well, I've been looking at these proposals for a while and with the 10 stories or so, um, they, it's always looked overbearing. I mean, that, but that was what it was. So I'm a little taken uh, thinking anyway <laughs> about the fact that maybe we suddenly changed our design. The applicant suddenly changed its design perspective to fit its market analysis because we were always looking at overbearing buildings and, it, and an abrupt change in in the in the density. So that that doesn't make sense to me to say we shouldn't do that because that's what they were always doing. Um, but. It is interesting. I'd like staff to respond directly to McWinney's market analysis. I mean, I feel like we're being, as McWinney is presenting a market analysis, which it says is definitive, that it can't expand the commercial. Um, staff is telling us we need this for the financial um plan of the city, uh, does staff uh, think that McWinney's market analysis is accurate or can staff point to something uh, inaccurate in, a, in McWinney's market analysis that, um, that makes us as council be willing to say, we've got to do that commercial. McWinney, you've got to do it. As staff sits here and, and, and looks at each other. Um, so that's a, that's a quasi perilous path um, um, to that, uh, that question. Council Member Lim, um, I'm going to have Anta Anner, uh, Anta Anner, Anna answer <laughs> as, as, as much as she's um, uh, comfortable answering. Um, Council Member Lim, I, I, I can't tell you the conversations that, that we have uh, had with, uh, with McQuinney. Um, there's a, it's similar to the other development conversations that, that, that we have been having. Um, and that is understanding and making decisions based on um, the influences that we see right now, not just internal to Broomfield, um, but those other outside forces that um, make decisions for us. And to what extent are we beholden to those outside market forces? Um, the market study, um, I've asked Mr. Harris um, to be able to provide this uh, council and, uh, and, and, and staff a 
a deeper dive into what the plan originally looked like to what the plan looks now. So, and it's, again, this is a specific site in the overall baseline development. Um, council has not seen the overall picture for baseline and what the vision was, what it looks like now, and, and what those out, outside influences, aside from the retail market study. Um, I don't think any of us are, are, are surprised, quite frankly, um, when we look at the, the, the retail market study, and, and I think we may be surprised by the vastness um, of what we were thinking was going to happen, even as, 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 even from 2020 to, to where we are now. Um, I think it, that takes all of us by surprise. Um, again, and it's, it's not just retail. It's all of those other compounding factors that if it was just retail, we could probably uh, program our way out of it in about five years. But it's not as easy as turning a switch on and something happens, and then you turn the switch off and it doesn't happen. And then you wait for something um, to occur that's a little more reasonable. Um, so McWinney's going to give us uh, a, a deeper dive, a bigger conversation before they, they come back in August. Um, I don't ever want to get to a place to where um, staff is countering our developers on the dais. We, we, we do plenty of knocking around as, as I look over at Mr. Harris. He and I have had uh, several conversations recently that, that, are, that are very difficult conversations to have. Um, but I believe that McWinney does want, uh, they, they want what's best for Broomfield. It's just Broomfield's approach looks differently than it has in the past. And to Councilmember Lim, to your point of, um, can we build in these triggers? Um, I don't know where, where McWinney or what the response uh, will be. We did build in those triggers with flat irons. Um, part of the commercial and uh, part of that residential. So we'll continue to hear, not just from Baseline, but every single one of these developers, especially the, 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 the larger scheme ones, you have to have the energy and the nexus of the people in order to get the retail to come. Um, you can't get the retail um, from a timing perspective until you have that nexus and energy. So it truly is the chicken and the egg. We've, we saw it in Arista. Um, where we were banking on something happening and it didn't happen <clears throat> for about a decade. So for these much larger developments, uh, it is the long game. It's just what happens in the short game that we can control and build in some mechanisms that gives us a better viability of what we think is going to happen. Anna, impart some of your wisdom on us, please. Yeah. Thank you, uh, City Manager Hoffman. I actually don't think that I have anything to add. Um, I'll just state we meet regularly with McWinney because of the phasing of development. And like was mentioned, we will continue to do that deeper dive and we'll be more prepared to have a more detailed discussion in the August concept review with the next phase that's uh, being brought forward. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Th thank you. I have more specific questions. That was more general. Um, do you, do, this is, these are from me, Winnie, do you actually have a grocery tenant um, that seems um, likely at this point in time? I'm going to let Rob answer that question. Thank you, Rob. Thank you for the question, Council Member Lim. Uh, we are engaging uh, two uh, very well known uh, grocers at present and trying to find the right uh, blend of size and economics that will help us secure that grocer or a grocer such that we can bring in a great deal of high level uh, small shop local and a blend of small shop local uh, tenants and a few nationals to complement uh, that grocer should we be able to uh, come to an agreement. Okay, thank you. Um, these are questions related to statements in the memo. So regarding inclusionary housing, there, the staff has a statement in the memo. It will be important 
important to understand the developer's intent regarding completion of inclusion inclusionary housing commitments and how these relate to the proposed residential land uses within the center street district would McWinney that that seems like to me like a staff statement saying eh, we don't exactly aren't getting a straight answer from the developer it's the funny uh, kind of way to state that to me um so would McWinney like to address um any ongoing discussion on inclusionary housing that seems to be in question. Thank you for your question, Council Member Lim. Uh, quite, quite frankly, um, we, we have not had inclusionary housing discussions specific to Center Street District, probably in large part because there's already an agreement in place which dictates how the inclusionary housing will come online over the course of time. So for example, you may recall that we have a certain amount of, call it market rate housing that we can put in, but that gets to a limit whereby we can't continue to do all market rate housing and then just wait until the very end and say, ah, now's when we're gonna do the inclusionary housing. There is a mechanism in place which ensures that we are doing both on a concurrent basis. And we fully anticipate that Center Street District will have inclusionary housing as a component of that, um, of, of that development area. We just haven't gotten to the detailed level yet of being able to articulate exactly where that will be. Okay, good, um, thank you. Similar question with open lands private and public. Um, when I looked back at my notes from the MGDA discussion last year, um, I asked about um, pocket parks in particular, um, and if you were um, ha planning enough of those near your residential <laughs> development. So now we have denser residential development in Center Street than we anticipated according to your current plan. Have have you allowed for a significant, you know, adequate number of pocket parks for the occupants of, of those multifamily residences? I'll make a, an attempt to answer the question, but probably I hand it over to the Nelson folks pretty quickly. Um, you're, you're absolutely right, Council Member Lim. The pocket parks have been very important to us in our residential areas, um, and pre predominantly residential areas. And we do, in the overall Center Street District plan, have plans, I think there are three areas. One is sort of the, the, the primary plaza in the interior of the development, and then there are some other smaller, I don't really think we call them pocket parks, but there are other areas of uh, ability to get out and um, enjoy. Yeah, thank you. If that's you, Jeremy, maybe you can outline some of those locations. Sure. Yeah. I so said to, to piggyback on Kyle's comment, there's quite a bit of um, both passive and active green space within the, within the Center Street District. So um, we have small pocket parks, again, that are used here to, to you know, provide amenity views and activity space for the uh, residential. We also have smaller ones that are kind of built within the blocks themselves. We've got some uh, linear park spaces along the streetscape widened out with opportunities for seating. We have these internal block green spaces here that can be used for, um, again, you know, they might have a series of natural plantings and formal spaces, places to sit, places to, you know, dog parks with built it within that. Uh, and then as we get into the village core, it becomes a little more urbanized in the fact that it's, it's more predominantly hardscape um, as, as opposed to landscaping, but there's going to be brought in islands with trees um, and softscape integrated within that, but lots of areas for outdoor dining. Um, and then even as we continue on out, you know, toward the frontage of Highway 7, there's linear park space in here that'll have greenery areas for seating. Again, as part of the retail spaces, there are out very dynamic outdoor um, you know, patio spaces that have greenery incorporated into them to really blend that, because we know that's a really overarching thing that we're trying to do here with um you know landscape and pollinator district and some of the things we're trying to do to keep this as green and as um you know vibrant as we can from a natural standpoint so it's very woven in throughout the entire district 
Um, some of it's in larger pockets, some of it's linear along streets, but there's quite a bit of, of amenitized green space throughout the district. Okay, thank you. Um, there was also a note in the memo um, that there was no on-site detention pond location identified yet. Is that in the works to be decided or what? Uh, so this is Jim. Um, we actually have developed the majority of the full spectrum detention that serves this area. It's already built downstream in the linear park areas. Uh, what will be added to this development is what we would call water quality ponds that would be perched up on the linear park side. So all the detention is realistically off-site from this location, but it's mostly built at this time. Okay, thank you. And um, Council Member Schaff has um, uh, is, uh, in, tr is in uh, traveling mode right now, and he has a one paragraph comment that he asked me to read. I share concerns with staff about the Center Street District. This was supposed to be the heart and economic center of the development. The commercial retail looks more like a strip mall in the midst of a moderate density area. The parking lots along Colorado 7 are not the gateway image we all envisioned for this project. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member Lim. That was, that was succinct. We will now go to Council Member Cohen. I will try to be as succinct. Um, I will follow up on Devin's comment because I was going to make something similar since this is a concept review that um, I think someone said that this is Center Street represents the um, there's an echo represents the there there of the development and quite honestly I'm having trouble seeing the there and, that, and to reflect what Rashaf said um, I know we're just dealing with bare boxes and very conceptual of what the design will be but what I'm seeing is um, I don't see the concept or the theme or what it is that is the center of this development that will be the, uh, the star attraction for a very highly anticipated development. You know, to me, the most exciting part of the, this development is Butterfly Pavilion and the Green Belt and the other along with it. You will not be able to see the Butterfly Pavilion from the highway. It's blocked completely. There's no promenade that leads to it or the STEM school. Um, so I'm curious, what is the concept, the theme, or what do you think you might come back with that will make this a star there, there of this development? Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Council Member Cohen. Um, I think I'd like to ask uh, Jeremy Hull and the Nelson team to talk about um, access way to the STEM school and the Butterfly Pavilion and the thinking behind creating the uh, central plaza as creating the there there. Uh, sure, Kyle. Um, so <clears throat> to, the, to the point of connectivity, um, we have Again, it, as we come along the street that goes south toward Promenade, the idea was um, that we have a series of linear green spaces that are along that street and the view widens out, um, kind of welcoming you to the linear park and the STEM school and the Butterfly Pavilion area of the project. So, you know, the, you know from baseline to the, to the Butterfly Pavilion is quite a long distance. And so activating that entire, um, you know, pathway to those is going to be very, um, you know, critical and and uh, unique on how we do that. Um, we're also using the parking does for both of those uses is kind of being pulled into the Center Street District and used as anchors and shared parking elements for for those two uses. So users of the Butterfly Pavilion and the STEM School will be parking kind of within these two, you know, southeastern blocks, um, you know, helping to integrate those two uses together. And then the scale of the space that's in the middle, you know, when we create the there, there, um, you know, having, you know, toured many projects around the country and understanding the scale of space and, and, you know, how we activate and program those core areas, you know, it's about creating the right amount of the right amount of activity at the street level or at the ground level for 
making these different retailers and restaurants as successful they can be. And that's that combines, you know, how we do programming within the space. The space can take on lots of different shapes, but it's really what we do within the, you know, the walls of that space out in the public areas that are going to make it very active and um, a place that people want to come back to over and over again. So, you know, it's going to be various areas within there that we can program for a variety of scaled events, whether it's a, you know, small music offering um, to, you know, a street festival, to a food tasting venue, to an art festival. It could be lots of different things that be used to program it, but creating that flexible space in the core is what's going to allow us to do that. And then having the other uses that are around that, um, as well as future uses that may come on from, you know, whether it's hospitality or additional residential help to populate that, you know, for that 18 hours a day where we need the activity kind of at the street level and in that, you know, that plaza space. So that's where that, that's where that heartbeat goes of activity. And if that is done right and activated and programmed right, everything around it then kind of elevates and becomes equally more successful, you know, compounding with what goes on in that, in that central space. So those are some of the things we're doing. There's also some inner, uh, inner block connectivity to the butterfly pavilion here. So if you're in the central space, you can see down through this space and see the butterfly pavilion. So we're trying to be cognizant of those view corridors within the development um, and making those, those different uses, you know, connect to each other as much as they can and still be there to, to complement one another. Okay, thank you. I think my the point is, I think it reflects what other council members are saying it, it, with high anticipation that I encourage you to be as creative as possible to find uh, a way to make this a, a gem that's not, at the moment, you know, it feels like very many other developments we've seen. Um, the conceptual architecture is very common. We see it in many other developments in town as well. So at the moment, it just doesn't shine perhaps as much as we hoped. And I would hope and encourage you to, when you come back, to give some more thought to how we can make this a really uh, singular destination for Northwest Broomfield. Uh, I wanted to follow up real quickly on another comment. I think you can, you've heard from a lot of council members who are obviously very interested in more commercial and, and greater density and as much commitment to that as much as possible. I wanted to ask in terms of time frame because I noted in the market that the decision about commercial versus residential was based on quote unquote current market conditions. So obviously the current market conditions are quite in flux as we are coming out of a pandemic which has caused some inflation which has caused the market to go way down and back up and so I'm curious what you know that the rest of us don't know. Um, what kind of time frame could we expect to that you know it's really hard to project a month out versus let on five years out on the market as it currently sits. Is there any opportunity to think this may be revisited or do you have long-term prognostication in terms of what's potential here in terms of more commercial? Uh, well, I, I certainly appreciate your recognition that uh, the <laughs> prognosticating much uh, these days beyond a year in advance, maybe even a few months is a fool's errand. And uh, we certainly before we put a shovel in the ground, I have no doubt that we will be testing these assumptions upon which this plan was built. So there could, I anticipate, there still will be some variability. Um, but as I think we mentioned earlier, the goal is to still have something by, call it third quarter, fourth quarter of next year from the horizontal side that we can move forward with. And again, in order to move forward with the horizontal side, we will have had to go to the bond markets, and the bond markets are not going to <laughs> issue anything unless they know that we have some demonstrable activity, uh, both on the commercial side, the residential side, and the office side. So uh, I, I appreciate your acknowledgement that this is a tough market. Answer. I just hope we we have a better situation soon that we can find more commercial and find more things we're looking for. And finally, I'll just close with a quick aside. This is a long-term concern about this whole development and that noting in the memo that Adams 12 still hadn't responded. Um, 
the impact on the schools in this area is, is going to be immense. I think anybody who knows Legacy High School is overstuffed dramatically and adding there really isn't there's no room for any more students at that facility and a K through 12 stem is not going to do much to alleviate um, legacy at all so I, I remain concerned and I hope we can engage with Adams 12 and f uh, we just need more we need another high school quite frankly and I hope there's some way we can work with Adams 12 so that more of this housing development doesn't uh, continue to um, negatively impact the available school capacity. That's all. Your mic's kind of um, So while we were um, moving through the, um, the master development agreement with McQuinney, um, even prior to that, the, the conversations that we've been having with the STEM school, um, Patrick Tennyson is in the audience, um, he is the champion for the Butterfly Pavilion. Part of the conversation that we've had with Adams 12 is carving out funding for Adams 12. Um, Kyle, I don't remember. I think it was 12 mils. Oh, geez. I shouldn't say anything because now I'm going to start getting messages and text messages and everything. That, that That's the incorrect amount. Um, um, out of that t tax increment financing, Kyle, can you add just in, in, in anything more um, from from that uh, that that Adams Twelve perspective? So again, trying to um, not keeping them whole, um, but part of that urban renewal agreement is uh, it's pretty significant for Adams Twelve. Thank you, uh, Manager Hoffman. You're absolutely correct. Um, just a few things that I wanted to touch upon, then I'm going to get, get to that part. And that is, uh, Councilmember Cohen, we do meet on a regular basis with Adams 12 to understand, I don't know how else to say it, but kid generation, <laughs> student generation within the communities. And uh, that, that happens at least on um, an every six-month basis. And what has been interesting is that enrollment has actually been going down, sadly, in Adams 12, probably as a result of the pandemic. Now, do we think that that's going to be a per Hopefully that is not a permanent condition, and we undoubtedly will be uh, generating more kids for Adams 12. But we've been working with them in lockstep to understand what this new STEM school will do to help alleviate in part, maybe not entirely, what's going on at Legacy High School. Relative to the um, financial feasibility of the STEM school and kind of speaking to when that actually could be constructed, um, uh, uh, Jennifer, you're, you're absolutely correct. As part of our agreement, we carved off, my recollection was closer to three mils, but it was still a substantial amount generated over time combined with other revenue sources that would enable the STEM school to offset a portion of the construction of the school. And I hope I'm not misspeaking. Uh, this really should be Superintendent Gadowski saying this, but, but my understanding is that they are looking to go vertical and then actually have their first class. I believe it's now 2026 is the latest that I've heard. Yeah. Um, they're going for a, a, a mill levy increase um, in November of this year. That's um, part and parcel of um, what, what that funding looks like. But it, it really is, a, a, again, the symbiotic relationship between the Butterfly Pavilion and the STEM school really being the hallmark for, for a baseline. That's always been the, um, that common vision. And um, actually, um, um, Superintendent Gladowski and I are planning, I think Mr. Harris is, is um, part of that follow-up meeting um, within the next week. Um, school districts are very anxious about the backfill from urban renewal authority areas um, and that money not being um, counted upon, which quite frankly will really change the dynamics of um, what that what that carve out looks like for um, for schools not having that backfill. So that's the additional conversation that we'll be having. So it's no wonder that time kills deals, correct? <laughs> Mr. Harris? These are such complicated topics. I, uh, I, I, yeah. Are you, are you finished, Councilmember? Thank you. Councilmember Lindstedt. 
Thank you, Mayor. Um, it's always good to see you, Mr. Harris uh, and McWinney team. Um, thank you for your uh, continued partnership um, and investment um, in North Broomfield. Um, the baseline development is, of course, a top priority of, of, of this communities, and we're, we're always very excited to see um, the next steps move forward. Um, you know, in 2005, uh, Broomfield started working on visioning um, what Highway 7 would look like. Um, and here, 17 years later, um, my predecessors, uh, myself, um, we've spent, you know, I, personally, I've spent dozens, if not hundreds of hours working on trying to get that BRT and that funding for that multimodal hub. Um, council Member Beacom, um, before, before I was on this council, spent you know, a, a ton of time um, and years uh, working trying to get funding for that BRT and for that multimodal hub. Um, so, well, I think this is a, a really, um, you know, the, the, this, this development, this, this plan in front of us is, is really wonderful in a lot of ways. It gives me a lot of heartburn um, when, I, when I see in the memo. Um, uh, the conceptual proposal is not capitalizing on these density opportunities and falls short of the optimal 30 to 50 dwelling units and jobs slash employees per acre and target 25 to 32 per acre densities necessary to support BRT. Um, last month, I worked really, really hard to get another $7.2 million uh, for preparation uh, for that BRT um, along State Highway 7. So it just it gives me a lot of anxiety um, when I see you know, a, a, a concern about a lack of density um, to get to those targets. And you know, this, this plan is by no means the linchpin for the, the regional priority of BRT from Brighton all the way to Boulder, but it's an important part of it. And it just, it gives me a lot of anxiety. Um, so when you bring it forward, um, I just would like you to keep that in mind. Um, and you know, I don't, the, the, the transition and making it, it look nice and you know, that's second to me. Um, we really need to try to get to those density targets. So um, that's kind of my, my only comment is just as someone from, who works, spends a lot of time in the transportation world, um, this, is, this is concerning, this, this uh, lack of density to hit those targets. So uh, if you want to respond, sure, but. Thank you, Member, uh, thank you Council Member uh, Lindstead. No, I appreciate the comments and we have been uh, proponents of public transportation for a very long time. We want the BRT, we want the mobility hub and certainly want to do what we can to support that as far as densities are concerned. What's, what's so interesting is that we get into this point where we end up in some ways having competing priorities because I think we could, well, we wouldn't have even done this. I mean, we could show more residential density in that area approximate to the BRT, so it almost becomes even more TOD than what we're currently planning, but in so doing, that may remove some of the commercial opportunities or the retail opportunities. And so it's, uh, which one do you do? And then you may say, well, go denser on your residential, which is an option, but for the fact that we can't get it financed right now. So. Uh, hear you loud and clear, all, all I can say is that over time, we have every expectation that this will continue to densify. And if I'm in your shoes, I'm saying, hey, McWinney team, make sure you aren't doing things that are not anticipatory of the ability to further densify in the future. Thank you for the comment. Um, I'll just I'll just say that you know office workers, people going to commercial, um, they could use that BRT as well. So I you know whatever you could do in the, in the future to, to try to try to hit those density targets, um, I, I would definitely appreciate it because it, it just gives me a lot of heartburn um, to see that concern in the memo. But um, again, I appreciate your time and thank you so much for 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 all of your investment and work here here in our town. So all right, thank you, Councilmember Anderson. Thank you. Um, so I just want to start by um, stating that I, I don't want to get into the long-range long financial plan and all of our concerns and the density and the need for the heart, but I, I just echo the concerns of others up here um, that we really do want to see this as the, this economic engine heart um, that we've been um, kind of expecting here. So I have a question as we're talking about um, bus rapid transit, and I'm wondering if, um, if you could give us an update on the internal shuttle and, and does that help us at all like 
but it's the fact that we're bringing all the people from inside of baseline up to Colorado 7, does that help address some of the um, need to ensure we have the density? And, and where are you at with the plans for that internal shuttle, shuttle and is, is it likely to come to fruition? <laughs> Uh, it's a good question, Councilmember Anderson. Um, I think that the reference is to an autonomous shuttle, which we have envisioned as one way to um, create internal circulation within the community. It is still part of the plan, uh, but I will tell you it is many, many years off because clearly we have to have the residents there to actually use the shuttle. Um, so this is, uh, we think it would be helpful, but at the end of the day, what it's really designed to do is facilitate internal transportation within the community as opposed to uh, bringing folks from outside the community. So it, it, it has a very narrow focus, if that makes sense. No, that, that is very helpful, actually. So it's, it's not really going to help us with the um, getting the, in, in lieu of that density um, if, if it's just internal. Okay. I think that's correct. Okay, thank you for that update. Um, and this might be a question for Anna. Um, I know we're talking, when we're talking about the Huron realignment, there was a potential for an underpass. And I'm just wondering if, if there's still plans for an underpass under Colorado 7 in that Huron Street area, and if that could be relocated to where the bus station is planned. Thank you, Council Member, for the question. There's a number of underpasses that were planned as part of the baseline community as part of the PUD plan. Um, a lot of it has to do with the location of where the drainage is and helping to locate um, potential pedestrian underpasses um, with the drainage in those areas where um, there is an opportunity. So there is a potential for an underpass at Colorado 7 east of Huron, um, but that would not facilitate a good location for bus rapid transit being so close to the mobility hub. Um, so it would be more likely that if an underpass or an overpass is proposed, it would be much further west. Um, and the developer has expressed interest and in, in ability to cooperate with it, but we don't have a, an exact location for it. So it's, it's hard to determine whether it would be an overpass or an underpass and whether there'd be um, an opportunity for co-location with any drainage, probably not, that I know of in west area, thinking from like Colorado 7 to the west. But, um, but there are uh, developments to the north of Colorado 7 that have anticipated and intended to cooperate with um, a few locations. I believe we have two um, that could help to drive potential locations for an underpass or an overpass. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, and then I have a question about uh, the actual dining options that are coming. Um, and this would be for Mr. Harris. The Anther Ranch residents specifically, a lot of them eat out. They go to Boulder, Louisville, other places. They are just dying to actually spend their tax revenue in Broomfield, and this is like the prime location for them. And I, a lot of them are looking for sit-down dining options, like dinners, or fancy dinners. Is, that, is any of that planned in there? Is this, like, what type of dining are you envisioning? So glad to hear that we've got a market ready to uh, <laughs> eat and drink at baseline. I think uh, since Rob is on, I'm going to turn that over to him. Rob, if you could address that, please, that'd be helpful. Absolutely. So thank you for that question. Since we've been marketing the availability of inline restaurant space and potential pad locations for food and beverage, we have been receiving very strong interest from local restaurateurs and artisans. As an example, we've had a couple of bakeries that are local to the uh, Broomfield community that have had long, uh, long-standing online businesses or wholesale businesses that want to do uh, inline retail. Uh, we've had coffee shops uh, on the smaller scale, so more casual dining. Uh, but just last, well, not last week now, time flies. Uh, about a month ago now, I was in Las Vegas at the ICSC convention, which is the largest uh, retail convention for commercial real estate in the U.S. Uh, and we sat down with several uh, larger format restaurateurs, some local, some national, that are looking for high visibility areas uh, within uh, this corridor uh, of Northern Colorado and the extended Denver suburbs. So I do anticipate that we'll have a selection of 
uh, of various uh, sit-down restaurants that will be complimentary. We're, we're, our strategy is to have, you know, one to four uh, really strong uh, retail category, excuse me, restaurant categories, so that we don't have overlap or competition. Look at what's in the market already. Uh, we're very sensitive to uh, try not to bring in competition that would hurt existing businesses. Uh, so we will be looking forward to entertaining more specific letters of intent from restaurateurs once we uh, solidify the site plan. Okay, thank you very much. I'm glad there's a consideration for those sit-down restaurants. Um, and sustainability. Uh, in the, in the uh, memo, it just talks about the native and pollinator plants, which is, which is very um, beneficial to the area. Has there been any consideration, though, on... Uh, like more like sustain, building sustainability and electrification, solar panels, lead certification. Um, is that coming? And I know that we'll get more details in the future, but what, what, like, what are you envisioning for sustainability? I appreciate the question, and you are you anticipated part of the answer is that uh, more of those details will be forthcoming when the vertical teams come in front of council for the individual site development plans for those projects. I will tell you that sustainability continues to be an important uh, tenet of this community to the point where we are, I think, uh, Matt Greenberg referenced it a little bit earlier. We are looking into the possibility, I don't want to say we've nailed it yet, of a microgrid in this area, which would be largely um, uh, based upon, not exclusively, but largely based upon solar. Uh, there's a whole financial analysis where we're undergoing uh, to that effect. And of course, the EV charging almost goes without saying, but yes, that would be a component of what we're doing. And I think the vertical team will need to determine to what extent lead or lead equivalent buildings will be forthcoming. But I know that... Um, uh, the tenets of LEAD are, are, are important, and I fully suspect that those will be incorporated into the vertical. Okay, thank you for that information. Um, talked about the schools, and um, okay, and, th and there's, there's just a few, a few other questions here. Uh, the, the mountains are so amazing here, and if, if you get it to Boulder, they have a little bit easier, easier um, access with the views. But there's like rooftop dining options where you actually see the mountains. Is there any consideration for for a lot like orienting any of those buildings so that you actually can, based on height or um, other structures, so you can actually get some rooftop dining options with mountain views? I uh, certainly hope so. And I would say, Nelson team, let's take note <laughs> to see if that's something that we can accommodate in the plan. As uh, I agree, the views to the mountains are spectacular. Okay, that would be awesome. And then Councilmember Lim asks about parks. And um, and I do see the pocket parts parks now, uh, um, but I'm just thinking about. I'm thinking this is also forthcoming when you start to see the numbers of projected children, um, especially at, like under 12, and ensuring that there's actually play structures and and like safe buffers from roadways, and and that's coming right. Um, but there would be thoughts for play structures if there's a fair number of children. Yeah, to to be, to be fair and to set expectations, I don't think we're looking at having significant amounts of play structures within the Center Street District, but rather those would be in the park pocket parks in the more residential areas, and then regional play would be in the larger uh, linear park. Now, I that that should, quite frankly, haven't really had that discussion about would play structures be appropriate in Center Street District, but I, I think it would probably be more appropriate elsewhere. Not even on the on the residential areas of there's a couple of parks over right up next to that residential potentially, site. and I think we'd have to look at that on a case by case basis. Uh, certainly, with the residential as shown on the plan, a lot of those will already have their amenities sort of complexes built in, so they're a little bit self contained. So I I would just hate to give the impression that there are going to be a lot of uh, sort of kid play structures in Center Street District. I'm just not sure that that's as much of the vision as it was to have those in other parts of the community. Okay, thank you. And then the, my last two questions kind of go hand in hand. There was the, there's been some, some discussion about the gateway image, and I'm just curious if you can like step back in time just a little bit and it, you know if there's any information you, you can provide based upon why the Butterfly Pavilion wasn't located on Colorado 7, where it was set back. Is, is it to keep the grocery store more accessible from the corner or is you know, just some, some of the thought process that went into that and also if it's you know I'm assuming it's going to stay where it is uh as you're you talking about these like you know walkways and the artwork I just 
I, I can't believe that Cosmo Schaff didn't add this, but there should be some kind of butterfly theme in the sculptures and something on Colorado 7 with butterflies mm -hmm. to like lead them in. So it's just common, but. No, all, all good questions. And uh, my, my trip down memory lane was uh, such that this discussion of where a butterfly pavilion, and Patrick can keep me honest over here, um, really predates any discussion about a grocery store. It really was where can you locate an incredibly innovative STEM school and a world-class invertebrate facility in an area that takes most advantage of your location. And we decided that that was going to be in the park itself so that education from the school can spill into the park. Similarly, all of the education and work that the Butterfly Pavilion does spills out into the park as well. So that educational journey continues. And um, so we're, we, we like where it's located. <laughs> we think it's the right spot. Okay, thank you. And I think just some, something on Colorado 7 to say butterflies would be amazing. So that's all my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Leslie. Thank you all very much. Um, yeah, you said it very well. This is a very complex project. They all are. I understand that. Uh, my, my colleagues have really said pretty much everything I want to say, except I have to correct my, my friend here, suggesting that those of us in Anthem Rancher dying to get into a good, <laughs> a good restaurant. <laughs> Frankly, at our age, we're dying for a lot of other reasons. But uh, I do want to reinforce uh, that theme. Uh, it comes up all the time. And so, um, yes, it needs to be uh, probably a variety of different kinds of things to meet the neighborhood as well. But anything you all can do to attract um, major restaurants, uh, fine dining, would be, would be most appreciated. But you just also said something that I, I think is really critical, and, and that's the frame around the Butterfly Pavilion, the world-class facility, the school, the, the STEM school, the views, the sense of Broomfield, the history, the traditions. And I don't, like my colleagues, I don't see that yet. Uh, I think you have a wonderful opportunity to really feature so much that's around us rather than if you will, hide it in the canyons. And so anything you all can do to come back to us with a stronger reflection on the fact that even though we're, we live here, we're surrounded by these mountains, but it would be wonderful to go to a restaurant where we actually could see why we're eating uh, or see the park. Uh, with the open, whatever the open space is going to be, you really haven't talked about that yet. Um, and, and tonight may not be the right time to do that, but again, I think that there's some opportunities here that are just not quite there yet, and I think you're hearing that from uh, the rest of us here on, on council tonight. Um, I do appreciate your commitment and, and your, you know, vocalizing that sense that you also would like to see something here really special, and so I just would like to encourage you to continue the journey here, focus on those key points that you've already made to us tonight, but we just don't see yet. And, and it may be we just, there's not enough there yet for us to see. Uh, the renderings are um, not intended to be what they're going to look like, but to kind of be examples of it, and, and a couple of my colleagues have already you know, noted that. So it's kind of like until we see what it is really going to look like, it's, it's really difficult for us to say, oh, okay, now I see it. So th that's the only thing I can not add, because it's already been said, but just enhance uh, for tonight. Um, this is a, a, a project that many of us, uh, my colleagues, have been involved with much longer than I have. So I'm more listening at this point than I am wanting to offer up anything, uh, except to reinforce what I'm hearing from my, my, my colleagues tonight. So thank you again for your work. And the team that keeps showing up and going away on the screen. Um, it, it looks like and appears to be a, a really outstanding team. And so I, I would, uh, unfortunately, that raises the bar. Now we all expect an outstanding uh, product. So thank you very much. Thank you. I think that's all the council members. Um, I do, I do want to go back to the Butterfly Pavilion because we, um, as a city and county, have also partnered with the Butterfly Pavilion and are committed and invested 
in in this very important piece, which I see as the shining jewel in this new city, within a city. And um, I would like to get some feedback from our partner, Patrick Tennyson, on this new proposal, if you don't mind. Thank you, Mayor Castriata. That's very nice of you to include me. I wasn't planning on speaking this evening, so I'll do my best here. Um, uh, thank you, Council, for having me. Uh, <clears throat> Butterfly Pavilion is honored to be a part of all of this. Uh, we've been working with Kyle for some time now, and uh, you know, City and County of Broomfield really embraced Butterfly Pavilion's move to Broomfield and has been so very generous in their commitment to our success. Um, just recently, um, uh, Mayor Castiata and, and uh, past mayors have come together to help help uh, help us with uh, some fundraising in the de in, in the Broomfield area, and it's such an honor to be working so closely with you. So. Uh, th thank you for that. Um, about this project, uh, it's interesting. Um, a lot of it is new for me because um, Kyle and I have not had the opportunity to connect a lot lately. We have been meeting recently um, in the last couple, uh, in the last month or two, which is fantastic. A lot, uh, how, however, has transpired, and it does look somewhat different than it used to. Good news is Kyle and I are planning to meet, I think, in two days. Uh, so, and it sounds like Kyle is working very hard to connect with the STEM school and uh, spend some time there as well. So, as a as a partner dedicated to this to to the success of this uh, yeah, um, this development, we uh, we are very proud to jump in and and connect and and help anywhere we can. Uh, there there is some definite opportunities. Uh, City Manager Hoffman mentioned earlier about nexus and energy of, of this development. And I don't think there's anything more um, energetic and inspiring than the Butterfly Pavilion being right here on Center Street. And to connect those two and to make that the, the pinnacle of the entire development, I think we can do a lot there. Um, and so I think there's opportunities that we can inspire. Um, and uh, and I think that in itself will draw people and draw a great number of people, and that in itself will inspire the retail and the and, and some of the other pieces that uh, I'm not sure if we're looking at. So those are my thoughts for now. It's um, it's early. I know I know the McWinney team has worked extremely hard and are dedicated to this, and I, I know we'll get where we need to be. But that's my thoughts right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tennyson. So is there a plan to move the STEM school away from the Butterfly Pavilion? Because it looks the same as it did in the 2021 version. Uh, Mayor Castriata, uh, there was one, I don't know if we can show that up on the screen, but we would not be moving it away from the Butterfly Pavilion if it were to move. It's almost as though it would leapfrog the Butterfly Pavilion and go from one side to the other side. And that would be if our traffic consultants, that's really the driver here, does it make more sense to have, uh, sorry, the STEM school closer to what's anticipated to be that full motion intersection? Does that improve the flow of traffic relative to the uh, STEM school? Um, so that was a possibility. And by the way, that's still anticipated to be uh, Center Street, which continues down and sort of bisects the park. That would be a grade separated crossing. So if that location ultimately were to be the preferred location, the kids would still have the ability to get from one facility to the other without having to cross the street. Okay. Well, thanks for that uh, explanation. Um, but it looks like it, the Butterfly Pavilion would be moved further into the the project because before it was on the opposite side of Center Street. I'm sorry, I want to make sure I didn't misspeak. The Butterfly Pavilion has, is, is in that location, and that's really where it's been from the get-go. It's just the STEM school that was located in most of what you've seen. Is, there you go. That's where it's been most of the right. time. So, okay. okay. 
That's that's right. I'm looking at I'm looking at a different graphic from April of 2021, um, and it just shows a street dividing it. So it's obviously not a street. Well, I think they're definitely designed to work together. So I would be very um, cognizant of keeping those two things in close proximity. Cool. Now, with the with the partnership that we have with the Brefai Pavilion, Jen, are we? Is this a partnership with with the baseline development as well, with the MGDA and all of the things that we've committed to, like flat irons? What's how is it the same? Um, well, so yeah. Um, I'm not being coy with the with 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 the answer. Um, flat irons uh, is what we consider to be a uh, reinvestment. So flat irons was really the first um, in our in our bedroom community going into a, a robust little hot spot. The first opportunity that we had to reinvest um, for a mall that had um, been on the decline and then exponentially so through COVID. So our relationship with, um, with Mace Rich, uh, as well as the council's commitment to front load. So um, baseline, when we're talking about a URA, um, Broomfield Town Square, so we talk about the, the three kind of hot spots. We have one up north, we have one south, and then we have one right in the middle. Um, the, the difference is from a reinvestment perspective, Flat Irons is our economic driver. It has been our economic driver, um, and we are grateful for Mace Rich coming in, um, wanting to, to re-energize. Part of a reinvestment is you invest on the front end. So it's not, it's, it's not um, the, re, the urban renewal area, like in, in baseline, um, also Broomfield Town Square to where we say you're going to keep a certain portion of that URA fund um, monies that, um, but for this project, we wouldn't have that income. So if that's considered a partnership, um, really a partnership is, is uh, you know, everybody, everybody going in with, uh, with, with a good faith effort, um, but not necessarily dollars in your pocket. So this is different, um, and, and we all know that, that baseline is, is green development, which quite frankly, from a city manager's perspective, give me green over redevelopment or infill all day and twice on Sunday. Um, it, 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 it has a, a much different load from council's perspective as well as from staff's perspective as well as financially. Um, there's a, a, high to a higher tolerance for risk on, on, on green development, and you can wait longer for it to uh, for it to produce so I don't know if that's answering your question I mean again from a from a partnership perspective um, baseline is a partnership um, I'm sorry uh, Broomfield Town Square would be a partnership flat irons would be a reinvestment for the economic driver um, we don't anticipate um, Broomfield Town Square being an economic driver we don't um, uh, at least for 10 years, count on baseline being an economic driver either. What's different between those two is when we see net negative. That's something that this council and the community needs to weigh in on, uh, again, from a, from a totality of circumstances. Um, where are the outside fluences? Where are we financially? And then we take a comprehensive view of, of each one of these projects. I, I ask because I remember we got the TIF approval from the Mahad Flood District, and there's mm -hmm. been several other um, commitments that we've made to, you know, move this project along as it was, was first portrayed. Um, and, it, and it's obviously not, not the same as it, as it was. Um, if the market returns, can Center Street accommodate more commercial? 
it kind of looks a little frozen due to the, the buildings. Yes, it's the answer to your question, Mayor Castro. Yes, yeah, Center Street can anticipate or can accommodate additional um, retail uh, if the market tells us that it's warranted. I, I think I need to make just a, a comment about, I think there have been a lot of references to the MGDA and the plan that was presented, and I, I just want to make sure that it's clear when we had presented those plans in 2020 and then they lasted, I think, even until 2020, not really plans, just figures. Mm -hmm. um, yes, the world has changed a lot even since then, but even in those plans, all of this retail and commercial was not coming up front. That plan, that MGDA, shows this development, this commercial development occurring over time. What you're seeing here is the first iteration of the, call it retail component of that plan. And uh, just to be honest with you, I struggle a bit when I hear about the first phase being net negative. You're like, oh my goodness, how could that possibly be? And I would love to work with council to, or sorry, with staff to understand that calculation because as I see it, um, and maybe it will be interesting to see how commercial is handled because we view commercial as generating a certain amount of AV, uh, which is accretive to a financial plan. But anyway, I don't want to, all that stuff we will work on outside of this. Um, just to let you know and answer your question, yes, there's some opportunity should the market present itself to further densify on the retail, whether in Center Street or in other places. And we'll look forward to understanding more about our impact on the overall financial plan with staff. Thank you, Mr. Harris. I mean, we're, as you know, we're being very mindful about uh, what development comes next that isn't net positive. Um, we have to provide services. And uh, we have no choice but to be very, uh, I guess, critical <laughs> right now. And so that's what you're seeing. We're not in the position we were two years ago, even. So um, I do appreciate you taking this journey with us to, to understand, and uh, I look forward to when you guys come back in August. Uh, is that the plan? And will there be a, a new a retail study when you guys come back? don't know the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Fair enough. All right. Well, um, I, we have a second round. Oh, I see Mayor Pro Tem. I don't know where that echo is coming from. Just how about Mayor Pro Tem? Can you hear me? Hey, Mayor, can you guys hear me? Yes. I'm not sure what my, what my connection is like here, but um, thank you. Uh, thank you, McWinnie. I, I do have one question for staff, and if this has been already addressed, I apologize. I just jumped on. And you could just tell me that, and I will consult with my colleagues later. But I was interested in the in the net negative. I, I did see in, in our our proposal, and it was just mentioned now by um, Manager Hoffman and then uh, Kyle as well that this project would be a net negative at least for the first ten years, is what I heard. So I was wondering what those calculations were, and how much of a net negative. Um, thanks for the question, Mayor Pro Tem. I don't. I don't want to say it's a net negative for the first ten years. Um, I can't. That's what you did say. I'm sorry. Um, that it takes ten years. I mean, again, from a phased-in approach, when we're looking at all of those, how many? How many phases, Kyle? Are we talking about? If it's a Center Street District we're referencing, we're looking at two two initial phases, which take us through that five to ten year period. So that's so. So from a point of reference, Mayor Pro Tem, it's the it's the five to ten year. Um, so when when we say when we say net negative until the commercial comes in, it is net negative. So when we know that residential services costs us dollars um, for the first year ever, we are offsetting. Um, for every sales tax dollar that is generated, we are attributing, um, I think it's 18%, 16 to 18% uh, 
Um, Jeff Romine, you can't see him, Mayor Pro Tem, but he's shaking his head affirmatively. Um, to those individual residents, so that is an offset. So and again, until the commercial comes in, and, 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 and this isn't a novel idea. This, this isn't something new that um, um, this staff or any other staff came up with. Um, when you have residents come into the area for the services that we deliver, it costs dollars. It costs dollars um, for the trails, for the open space, for the infrastructure, for the roads, for the rec centers, for the library, for all of those other services that we have um, so become accustomed to here. Once the commercial comes in in order to offset that, um, it does exactly that. It offsets it. So it's, it's not unlike what we saw in Arista where we had planned and programmed, uh, which is why we are moving away from, um, moving towards the long range financial plan being a forecast document, not a decision making document. Building a model that then we can adapt based on changing circumstances. So we can have one that influences our decision and we can have another that we plug in to help us make those decisions. So council's making a well informed, timely, decision based on current markets, not unlike uh, what McWinney is doing uh, right now. They are adjusting based on what the market will drive. Municipalities should adjust on what the market is driving as well. You can't see his face, but Kyle Harris is also shaking his head affirmatively. So again, this, this is, it's not a new way to think of things. It's just in Broomfield, we have not applied that before. Of course, none of us have been through uh, an um, unforeseen pandemic um, or Jennifer, inflation. Yeah, I, uh, Jennifer, if, if I could just jump, jump in because I don't want to keep this going. I, and, and I agree, it's not something that we've ever discussed before until very recently. Um, but I guess what I really wanted to know if, if, is if you had, as this was proposed and, and presented to us you know, tonight, do you have numbers? Because I, I didn't see any numbers. I, I seen discussions that it was net negative, but I'm not... It's not clear to me, at least, how much of a net negative. So all I really want to know is, do you know how much of a net negative this would be for the first five to ten years? And if you have those numbers, great. If you don't, you know, I would just want to see those, obviously, before we made any decisions um, going forward. Sure. No, because the concept review is, is again, it's conceptual. So as soon as we know what those, what the, what the particularly what the units are, the numbers of units, and what that phased-in approach looks like, we'll be able to do the numbers. Okay. Okay. Um, Nothing else. Yeah, just uh, obviously we want to see those numbers at some point. Um, but okay, thank you. Appreciate it. All right, thank you. We're going to the second round, and you have two minutes, Council Member Ward. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I guess as some of my previous colleagues were um, talking, I came up with a few extra questions. Um, one is regards to the transit walkability whole thing. Um, bike parking was kind of mentioned at the BRT station, um, but can you speak more broadly, McWinnie, to how you're going to incorporate bike infrastructure and what that kind of bike infrastructure will look like? Specifically with parking, we've already gone over through previous developments, how you want to do bike lanes and separate pads and all that uh, fun stuff. But bike parking and, uh, specifically, could you talk about that? Thank you for the question. I'm going to ask the Nelson team if they can give some examples of how we would be incorporating uh, bike parking into the plan. Sure. Um, I think, you know, with all the bike connectivity that we have around the site, I think you were we would promote having multiple, you know, bike parking areas within the development. We can do those, you know, those quite often we'll do sculptural elements that become bike parking um, areas where you can lock up your bike. Um, a lot of these mixed use developments that we work on have a bike share component to them where you can rent a bike and go for a ride where it's in the linear park and come back, you know, to the town center. Um, we want to welcome that connectivity as much as we can. So the, you know, the sidewalks and the, 
um, you know, where we have bike lines, bike lanes on the street, but then when we have sidewalks that maybe go through park spaces, we want to be able to accommodate that that use in there as well. But within the, within the core and within probably each individual block, we would have um, multiple areas where you could park bikes, lock them up, um, integrate those into the hardscape design from a sculptural standpoint, um, so that you know we we promote that as much as we can as as a form of transportation. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you have any plans on incorporating uh, bike share, scooter share, like Lime, et, uh, et cetera? So um, we would, this is my personal opinion, I would absolutely love to have uh, Lime, the scooters, uh, the e-scooters, the e and quite frankly, e-bikes as uh, potential modes of transportation through baseline. I think it helps to solve part in part the last mile problem that we have when we're trying to get to, uh, let's say, the BRT station, should that materialize, and the uh, larger um, station on I-25 and Highway 7. So uh, the answer is yes. The question is, will there be enough usage, enough density? I think there will be, but enough for it to be worthwhile for these uh, companies to decide to deploy in those areas. Okay, perfect. Um, and then following along with that last mile, first mile problem, I know Councilmember Anderson had mentioned the internal circulator. Why is that not being a solution to that first mile, last mile portion, having a connection at the Highway 7 BRT stop? I think it could be part of the solution internally to baseline. But I, I, I interpreted uh, the comment to be, will it also bring people from outside of baseline to that station? And as currently envisioned, it would be specific to folks internal to the community. But in answer to your question, could it be used to drop off at that BRT station? I don't see why not. So yes, in that regard, it would help with the last mile to the BRT station that's near Center Street, and quite frankly, to the uh, to the larger multimodal on I-25 and Highway 7. And in fact, that was what the circulator was originally designed to do, was to get people to the mobility hub at I-25 and Highway 7. Okay, great. And then my last, uh, I guess, more comment, if anything, um, is regards to some of the, the things that make this place a wow place to go. Um, have you thought about incorporating uh, spaces like um, that can be used in different parts of the year for different things? Like in the winter, you have an ice skate, an outdoor ice skating rink, and in the summer, it turns into I don't know what, something else. Um, or you have um, kind of a performance area for musicians or I don't know, local groups that want to do maybe some outdoor acting kind of things. Uh, has that ever been discussed? Yeah. So that we have, so in the middle of the, of the village core, there is, um, you know, a lawn element that's depicted. Um, that would be our, main location to do that flexible programming activity but there would also be other subset spaces maybe a smaller space maybe somehow associated with you know this position up here there's another small space where we can do maybe some gaming outdoor gaming kind of opportunities there but we would definitely have um you know programming is such a vital element to what we can do to help promote dwell time within the retail and so we want to have as much flexibility in the design of that space that allows us to do just exactly what you say, which is, you know, it's seasonal opportunities. It can be daily different opportunities for programming, whether it's, you know, yoga in the park on Tuesday afternoons to a kid's after, you know, kid's morning on a, on a Friday to having a live music act, you know, on Saturday nights or something like that. So that's a critical thing to what we plan in every project we're doing. And the main event is kind of right where that number one is shown. And then there would be smaller spaces throughout that could be used um, for different scales. And there is a large space within the linear park that could be used for even larger 
you know, gatherings. I think that you can, you can host a couple thousand people for an event that's in the amphitheater that's in the linear park. So we have a variety of scaled spaces to accommodate that programming. The other thing we've also added is a paseo uh, between uh, the passageway from the BRT at number 16 through to number one. Uh, the building that we've got right smack dab in the middle, um, we also see that as being a um, building that can open and close that in inclement weather, that's where somewhere you gather. Um, that again, trying to find ways that the buildings can be more flexible um, in terms of how they're used. Um, and the other thing that we're trying to do at the moment is, is give you a hint um, so that the building directly north of um, what we call like the food hall um, element, that was kind of speaking to the roof lines with views to the mountains and, and those kind of things. So we're already starting to, to think about those kind of things without giving too much architecture in this conceptual plan, but giving a framework for potential. Okay, great. Thank you. That's all my uh, questions. All right, thank you. Any other second round comments? Council Member Anderson, two minutes. I'll do one, thank you. Um, so I just wanna clarify my question earlier about the internal circulator was, what was just for baseline, like for people coming to and from the bus rapid transit within baseline. So, and, and whether being able to pull all those people from further south and baseline up to Colorado 7 could actually help us with the densities needed to show that BRT was supported. Got it, thank you for the clarification. Yes, I do think that that circulator would enable us to draw people from further south within the community to the BRT station, yes. All right, thank you. Anyone else? For the good of the cause, all right, well, I think we've exhausted this. Um, I thank you all so much and um, you know, keep on keeping on. That's, that's what we do. I appreciate the thoughtful comments. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you. I think we need to take our 10 minute recess break now. So it's 837. We'll resume at 847. Thank you all.
Test, test. Test, test, test. Yeah. Isn't that weird?
everyone. Oh, I'll do this. Welcome back, everyone. Our first study session item this evening is an update on Broomfield development with a focus on commercial development and the resulting fiscal impact. Council has a copy of the agenda memorandum, which I'll ask our staff to summarize. Thank you, Mayor. And Mr. Romine is going to introduce us. He also has um, his chaser, <laughs> which we've all come to. Um, we don't even call him Maddie anymore. We do call him the chaser. So this is um, the kind of the, the culmination of uh, the last five to six council meetings since March. Um, as council knows, we, we have discussed uh, development 101, 102, budget 101, 102, residential, um, how residential plays into it. And we've had some sobering conversations. I'm excited to say that tonight starts the much funner version of the things that are in the pipeline that are um, what we have uh, been working towards for two years, really identifying and targeting, utilizing that development matrix, um, and really utilizing the chaser position to what we have been talking about is identifying what we want and sending someone out proactively to bring in what it is uh, that will be most beneficial for us short term and long term. So as we move through this uh, presentation, Mr. Romine is, um, is going to hand it off. Um, and we're going to hear directly what's in the pipeline, what has been approved, the square footage, the dollars that it will generate, and what the timing is to come on board. Our hope is, from a staff perspective, uh, Ms. Ritchie is also here this evening, um, that when we come to um, the recommendations in August with regards to what we need to focus on uh, specifically and what some of those um, um, limitations are to give us a 24-month, I don't want to say time out, but certainly be much more selective of what we do bring in, um, we, we believe that to be uh, the culminate, it will culminate in, in uh, the end of August, so that starting in September, we're able to communicate that on the front end with the developers. So we are nearing the final stages of our 10 meeting cadence. So, so much better to, to, to have the tail end of something positive, Mr. Romine. Okay. Um, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of council, uh, both here in, in hybrid and uh, city manager Hoffman. First off is, is thank you for allowing us to be here tonight. Um, this isn't not just Matt's and my presentation. This is actually all of us, um, city manager's office, as well as uh, Anna and her team, as well as Brenda and her team. So next slide, please. Um, again, as, as Manager Hoffman pointed out, um, we've been in a journey. That journey started actually even before she pointed out, before the uh, focus study session that you all had back in the beginning of March, and we'll continue. Uh, and while um, the key parts of this will be ending in a few more months, uh, this work will continue for a long period of time. And so you'll keep hearing us talking about it over and over again. That's just a quick slide to remind you of the last two study sessions uh, that Anna led. And, and so this one builds on those two. Next slide, please. One of the key points that we've been making since the, the, uh, the council retreat and going forward is just thinking about development in the three major categories. Um, these categories are part of the long-range financial plan. They're the underlying basis of that. Um, at the same time, they're also what's really happening within our community and how it really fits. So this isn't a hypothetical. This is not some sort of, uh, you know, uh, mathematical model. This is actually the way the world is operating and the way that we think about development within our community. And that is we break it into three groups, commercial, retail, restaurants, those things that most of us go to on a regular basis. Um, you can see a couple of examples of uh, businesses here in Broomfield that fit within that category. The commercial non-retail, uh, we also put up a couple of ideas of what those are, and you can get a sense. And then the residential, you're very familiar with that, and it's both single family and multifamily. It gives you a sense of what the breakdowns are from a sales tax perspective. It also gives you the rates. Um, and it shows you what, what the relative scale is. So as you can see, residential generates about $42 million, $41 million. 
um, from those two tax revenue sources, whereas, as you can tell, commercial retail restaurant is generating um, in excess uh, of close to 50-some million dollars. And that, so that's just that one portion. I would also reference, just so that you have that information, um, that, and this is critical, that real and business property taxes are what underlies the commercial side. There is no real or there is no um, business personal property tax equivalent on the residential side. So it represents the two sides. Um, and thinking about the completeness of it. Next slide, please. This is actually the way the financial or the long range financial plan um, illustrates. This just gives you a quick summary of it. You can again see the commercial types and the residential types. You can see what the population is compared to the employment. Um, you can also see the square footage. So as you'll note in residential, we have roughly, um, and this is in 2020, um, when it was approved in 2021, so it's relying upon the 2020 numbers, we had roughly 64.6 million square feet of residential. Nobody ever thinks of it that way. You oftentimes think of number of housing units. Um, but nevertheless, that's just the way that we, we break it into the model. And then the other side, you can see that the commercial total that includes the office towers, that includes the King Supers, and, and it includes the Morton Guitars and others, um, is about 20 million square feet. So you can get some proportionality there. At the same time, you've heard us talk about um, the ratios um, and, and those types of things, and you can also get a sense of what those costs are. The key on this slide is just to look at that bottom line, which is the long-range financial plan ratio. And what that helps you understand in, in just short, uh, in just a short sentence is, for every residential dollar on average, and this is the key, because obviously there's a big difference in tax revenue between a million dollar house and a $400,000 house. But on average across Broomfield, it generates about 63 cents of revenue for a dollar spent or you can reverse it if you'd like in your head. Either way, but nevertheless, that's when Jennifer, or, or when City Manager Hoffman talks about residents cost us, this is on an average level. This is not specific to a individual house. So when we get into doing some of the analysis, we start getting into the more detail, but this gives you the overview. On the other side, commercial generates roughly $2 for every dollar of cost. That's that relationship that we, we've been talking about and referencing for the last um, uh, last four or five months so far. Next slide, please, Jake. Um, it, it, and this is really important, and this is what we're talking about when we say development choices are changing and need to be changing. You can read this, but the key points for me is, is we've increased the collaboration within our teams. We've now started the matrix and been using that for a number of months. And it's not just Matt, um, Mr. Brandon, or myself that's using that matrix, it's all of us. Um, I can say that I had a conversation earlier with the mayor, and she was somewhat, she was using the matrix and talking to the developer. Many of you do too also, and obviously City Manager Hoffman does too. The catalytic projects, as you've heard and know, Flatirons is moving forward. We just heard a presentation about Center Street and the first retail node that would be going into Center Street. We talked about Broomfield Town Square. So our catalytic projects are moving forward. At the same time, we have smaller developments coming forward, and Matt's going to talk a little bit about those too. As we, get, as we go forward, and I'm not going to spend much time because we probably have said this so many times, you can quote it to us. This is about getting to a quicker yes or a quicker no. This is not about something that we haven't thought about. We've oftentimes talked about three questions, right place, right time, uh, and, and right kind of um, development. The matrix, next slide, please. Um, you've all seen it. It is on our web page. It's also something we've referenced. This is not a static document. This is something we keep working on. But the real key point that I oftentimes talk about with other folks is the matrix, and I've talked about this with other cities who said, wow, this is really interesting what you're doing. Um, we tell them that this is not about a final outcome. This is very much about encouraging a conversation. And that's what we've been doing for over a year with the matrix and will continue to do, and that's what the emphasis is about. Next slide, please, Jake. 
To give you some sense, since we're talking about commercial development, we wanted to help you understand exactly where we were compared to where we were when we got formed as a county, so roughly 20 years look back. Um, and that's really always important. So in, in tw 2002, we had 25,700 employees here in Broomfield. Those are firms and people that are being employed by those firms. That's not the number of residents or the number of people working in the labor force. This is about people working in the businesses at Interlochen or on 120th. And, and just for a clarification, just so you understand, those color bars, they built up to the 25,000, but it talks about four different categories. We tend to, on a business attraction standpoint, oftentimes talk about two or three of those categories more so than anything else. And Matt specifically focuses a lot on technical, um, 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 technology, finance, and profession, as well as production. That's the manufacturing side, such as Hunter Douglas as an example. So in two, 20 years ago, we had 25,700 employees. Today, um, and this is the latest information. This is a, this is roughly about six months old because that's how long it takes for the, us to get this data, for the state to compile it and get it to us. We're at 40,500 employees here within the community. And you can see the breakout. The real key takeaway on this slide is, as you'll notice, there's been efficiencies, economic efficiencies gained through hospitality and retail. So less employees to do more work or to generate more tax revenues. But at the same time, as you can see where we were two years ago, you can see that evolution that people have been referencing because of COVID. On the other side of our economy, though, what has really been growing is the professional, technical, finance side of our economy. Those are oftentimes $100,000 a year jobs, $130,000 a year jobs, or $80,000. So they tend to pay a little bit better, um, and they tend to be a little bit more what I would call footloose and fancy free. So those companies can locate, and so they're choosing to locate here. They're not here because of our population. They're here because we have a lot of great things um, in the community. Speaking specifically, if you go to the next slide, Matt, um, Jake, and that is, is so... Um, Really, what, when we talk to businesses, we try to find out why they are here and why, therefore why they want to stay. And so these are the things that they say to us. Um, these aren't things that I said. These are things that we've heard from our business leaders. The workers are talented, and they understand balanced work life. Um, what, what that means is they do know how to both work and play um, and, and know how to live a, a really high-quality life uh, here in Broomfield. And Broomfield, in fact... Um, brings that out in people with our open space and with our other other amenities, with our access to the mountains and access to arts and other things. Um, the proximity and easy access to, and we leave it as two because it's to other markets, it's to the airport, it's to world markets. All of those things are true. Um, as many of you know, I used to work for the city and county of, uh, of Denver before I came here, um, and we oftentimes talked about the access to the airport on the A-line. But at the same time, it's as quick to get to the airport from Broomfield, from Interlochen, as it is from downtown Denver. And so when firms are thinking about it, that's what they're really talking about. They don't have an affinity to place necessarily. They have affinity to all of those kinds of benefits and amenities of a community. So that's what that represents. At the same time, we get lots of questions about what, are, what do we have to offer? What are, we do, what are we about as a community? And so I'm going to turn this presentation now over to Matt, who, because he's the one that's fielding many of those questions. So Matt? All right. Thank you, Jeff. Um, my name is Matt Brandon, Business Development Officer uh, with the Economic Vitality Team, or the Chaser, as we know the position. So what, do, what does that mean? Um, basically, I'm the person who, if somebody is not familiar with Broomfield and they want to learn more about it from a non-tourist per perspective, I educate them about Broomfield. What is it like as a business to operate here? What is the region like? And so on. So as Jeff was saying, these are the questions I get asked. Um, it's nearly all of them boiled down in a very simple way. Um, and there's, there's nuances to each, but just to go quickly through them, um, there's a handful that are very specific to um, the municipality, so specific to Broomfield, some that are state-specific, and some that are kind of in between. So um, the only ones that are really purely Broomfield that I get asked are availability of space and fit, how soon can we occupy and operate, and possibly most importantly, quality of place. 
So the other things, workforce conditions, specific fields and costs, crucial, number one question for every business project that I work on, but we benefit from a really skilled workforce in Broomfield and the entire region. So while we may have you know, a pool of 40,000 jobs, so to speak, that I can talk about in Broomfield, the labor force here is closer to, I, I believe it was like 1.2 million is the number that we use. So that's the number of people who can commute to positions in Broomfield. Um, yeah, and next slide. So, um, so this is this slide basically represents the uh, what I guess an overview of what that looks like. So we have them anonymized. So projects one through eighteen. Um, these are all of the companies or consultants or real estate teams who have come to us and said, "Hey, we want to look at Broomfield. What can you tell us about it?" So uh, we think of things from the you know the highest level, square footage, jobs, and investment. And then um, we also track in a very detailed way, you know, what, what are the specific needs of the company? Uh, what kind of culture, what types of companies do they want to be close to? What are the regional amenities they need and so on? So um, in addition to that, a big part of my job is um, deciding who are we going to target? We don't just sit and wait and hope that the right companies come to us. We are proactive. We reach out, we're um, calling into you know, companies themselves, real estate teams, consultants who do site selection, which is just you know, business real estate decisions. Um, we're reaching out to all of those people, and then these are the industries that Broomfield is really a pretty good fit for. So um, when I'm thinking about this and how I spend my time, a lot of it is working on you know, projects like this, you know, the 18 to 25 or so that are active, you know, we're communicating and they're looking at current real estate. And then I'm also thinking about who am I going to target? So um, the things that we'll consider are like, you know, what are the industries that we can bring here that bring the follow on investments? You know, if we, if we attract company X, are they going to bring their entire supply chain to the region? Are there going to be, you know, um, economies of scale if we can get a certain type of like worker and company into Broomfield? So um, there's the project element, there's the outreach element, and then kind of like that higher level strategic thing that we're trying to do from our team. Um, and this is also where I talk about, you know, what is Broomfield like as a place? So we have all of the um, specialty shopping that you can look for in Flatiron Crossing and others, um, the authentic sit-down restaurants, you know, great places to go and grab a beer that are, you know, it's just a really good community. And then the active lifestyle businesses. So we love to talk about, you know, the Vail Resorts of the world at a, you know, kind of corporate level all the way down to axe throwing. You know, it's everything in between. Uh, next slide. So um, I thought it'd be helpful to just outline, uh, this is essentially a, um, a timeline of the site selection process. So um, it looks very, very different. Literally, you could take two companies in the same industry that are similar size and their timeline is leaps and bounds different. So this is just representative. It's not definitive, I guess. Um, but yeah, just to go through it. The, um, so when a company is deciding where they're going to invest and hire their next tranche of employees, what does that look like? Um, those first four to six months, um, they're, you know, probably confidentially looking at multiple communities. You know, they're looking at Denver, Phoenix, um, you know, Salt Lake City and several other markets. Um, sometimes we're contacted as part of that process, but sometimes it's done independently. Um, what's interesting is if, um, if we don't have um, product available, pro when I think of product, I think real estate. Like if we don't have suitable real estate options that are marketed and, you know, they're coming to market at a, within the next 6, 12, 18 months. If that doesn't exist, then we're cut off at the knees right there. And so we don't have an opportunity to really bring that business to Broomfield. So um, that, that kind of just illustrates the importance of having, you know, not just a really good business user pipeline, but also a really good real estate pipeline of really interesting real estate coming to Broomfield. So that's that first four to six months, um, five to eight, they're doing financial due diligence. They might ask us, you know, what, what's the tax environment like in your region? What are, you know, locally, what does it look like? What's the mill rate? You know, where, what's transportation like? And they're looking at not just, you know, taxes, but operating costs and basically every cost that a business is going to need to consider. 
um, months nine through 12, they're likely getting into negotiations. So maybe they've narrowed down to five markets, you know, some of those that I've mentioned, or um, they might have narrowed down, you know, Broomfield and then maybe two or three of our um, sister communities. And um, they start actually, you know, negotiating and speaking with not just the communities, but the landlords, the property owners, and so on. Um, they might, and, and this is where incentives might be discussed, but it, it's, um, that's just a very small component. It's every, they want to know about the workforce and everything else. During that time, they're likely starting the building design and figuring out, you know, okay, we've narrowed it down to these 10. We can start to dial in what the building itself is going to look like, what we're going to need. And so that's, that's done usually kind of concurrently with the late stages of negotiation. And then finally, maybe a year in, um, where we get to actual tenant improvements, construction, they're you know getting permitting, and they're they're hopefully um, you know within months of getting into their space. And then month eighteen in this scenario is move in. So a um, couple things to consider is just that uh, again, this is a business user timeline. This is not the um, planning timeline or anything like that. Um, it's um, it, it's very rare that a business user is going to be the one doing the development, but that does happen. So in that case, say if a user wants to come and build, you know, a couple hundred thousand square foot building, they are the developer and the user, and you know the process is a lot longer than this. Um, also interesting, if you um, consider a lot of the companies that are in the news, they're, maybe they're getting venture capital investment or. Um, they're just a fast-moving industry. Um, they won't wait six months, six months, uh, much less 18. So if we don't have active space available to them, you know, in two, three, four months, they're going to take their Series A investment and you know put it somewhere else where they can find real estate. So again, really just wanted to zero in on the importance of having compelling real estate options if we want to win some of these projects. So next slide. And just wanted to illustrate, I, I think we're all fairly familiar with this map, but it just shows uh, the concentration of commercial development across Broomfield. This is our own planning map. Um, so a lot of the discussions, I, I honestly start with this map a lot of times, or a similar one, if I'm introducing Broomfield to a national consultant or a real estate team from out of, you know, out of state, just because they maybe they don't know Broomfield and I want to show them here, you know, when you visit, here's where we're going to take you and what the business environment is like, and here's what's coming. So next slide. And um, I mentioned a product and kind of how I think in terms of, you know, what am I actually talking to companies about? Yes, they want to know about the quality of place. Yes, they want to know about, you know, workforce and all that good stuff. But um, most companies just need a place. So when I look at the next three to five years. This is not all of the projects that are planned in Broomfield, but these are the ones that I think about in terms of commercial non-retail businesses that I'm trying to bring here. So um, maybe starting from the bottom, um, I, I look at you know several hundred thousand square feet of office um, space coming. One point, I think it's 1.8 of industrial, light industrial, um, think of like North Park uh, one through four places like that coming to market, and Flex, um, so that you know could be office, industrial, something in between. So that's typically like your R and D or medical technology user. So um, I don't know how else to put it other than we're in a really good spot. This is a really good, especially for a community of our size. This is an amazing real estate pipeline to be looking at. So we have a lot to offer. It's just going to be a matter of bringing this to market officially and then really getting it out to the right people. So um, yeah, I, uh, I guess next slide. I don't want to get too deep into the weeds. So um, and I guess at this point, I'll hand it back off to Jeff to wrap up and talk about some of the further topics. Thanks, Matt. So, Mayor and members of council, one of the things, th there's two real big takeaways in this. And, and first off, and you just talked about it for the last two and a half hours with Center Street, and that is, is there's market demand um, that it currently exists, and trying to understand that and understand that timing. That's really part of what we were trying to convey a little bit tonight um, as part of the beginning of this, of this element of the conversation. As Jennifer says, it's a really positive story. 
So, but as you know, residentially, as you heard um, Kyle talk about with Center Street, there is demand for 1,100 units, as an example, in Center Street right now. Um, so we're not talking about that. We've already, uh, Anna talked about the 6,000 that are currently coming forward in the next three years. What Matt is showing you is exactly what the commercial side looks like. It's a little less definite in the sense of that it'll all be occupied in the next two or three years. Um, this, this, the, the kind of pipeline that we have on the commercial side is, is, in, is already, you've seen many of these projects. They are marching through city council. What they will do, using the example of, of Sims Technology Park, 600,000 square feet. They're already in. They're getting ready to start construction on that. They will not build 600,000 square feet. They will likely build 200,000 square feet. As soon as that begins to lease up in an orderly manner, then they'll go ahead and pull permits on the next 200,000. And so what we've got before you is, is that pipeline, if you will, of what can move forward in an orderly manner and can, can happen. The second part of what Matt wanted to share and, and did share was the reality of what the timing is from a firm standpoint compared to what the timing is from a development standpoint. Um, when, when Anna and I and, and the city manager and others, we talk about development and the amount of time it takes sometimes on commercial projects, um, that's one of the things that we're trying to constantly deal with and that Matt has to deal with because when they knock on the door, as you saw, they're already probably three months into a review. They're preparing to go to a lease or a purchase option. They're likely going to do that financing within the next three months. At that point, whether it be a Series A or corporate money, they want to be turning that into occupied space and starting to employ people. You oftentimes will hear about a firm employing or moving to Broomfield, not because of an announcement about the real estate, but because if you're paying attention to some of the online hiring portals, all of a sudden you'll start seeing companies saying, Broomfield location for this company, and you're like, Never even heard them being here, but they're already starting to recruit their employees because that's what they need to do. When we're in this talent environment where, quite frankly, that's where Broomfield competes, as does, does the uh, Denver metro area, it is about talent and it is about finding the right locations. So those factors that, that Matt shared, those factors that I shared, it's about how we're reaching out to those future employees because that's what the companies are chasing. They are not chasing the location as much as they're chasing the location where their workers want to be in this metropolitan area and, quite frankly, in this community. So what we've shared with you tonight is, is a little bit about both pipelines, the, the attraction pipeline, those that are going to occupy the space, something, uh, some more detail to give you some, some ability to think through and, and evaluate as we're c continuing these conversations around the commercial pipeline. But the key here, and, and this is a frustration that we all share, and that is, is oftentimes we'll hear developers and or firms say, why can't it be open now? I need this, I need this space tomorrow. And so as we think about part of, or I shouldn't say we, as you think about part of the conversation as we present them in July and August uh, and these conversations going forward, it's about how do we get that space to fit up with the time of the firms because that's really what we're about. It is not the same timeline nor the same marketplace as the residential. Um, so that's where the challenge is and that's part of what your consideration will be as we, be, as we continue this conversation in July. So at that point, um, these are just a few of the things we'll be talking about. These are things that you may want to reflect on between now and the study session, just how this fits in your mind. Because as you asked um, the city manager, where are we going? That's the, the next step in this is how do we want to, how does council want to advise staff to, to move forward in these and bringing all of this together um, and to move forward. Next slide, please, Jake. So this is the last slide. It's also, it's in your memo. It's also in the presentation that you have a copy of. This is the cadence of what's coming next. And some of those you'll see are in business meetings and some are study sessions. Um, but in July, Anna and, and uh, City Manager Hoffman will be coming forward with some thoughts and some directions for you all to, to begin to tell us how to make some of these next decisions. Then we'll be going in and starting to talk about the financial side, both the 2023 budget and just thinking about bond obligations and other things, which was part of the conversation that I know you talked about last month. So you can see these things all starting to march forward. So we are, as Jennifer said, we've told you 
some of the hard news. Now we're starting to tell you the positive side, which is this commercial does pay. We are in a strong position, as Matt summarized, and we think that there's a great opportunity for employment and, and commercial growth within our community. You've heard it from several developers coming forward, and they're telling you what they're seeing in their market studies. And I would suggest to you that oftentimes those are I don't necessarily know if I want to say the worst case scenario, but they're the base case scenarios of what they see coming. So on that, I'll conclude the presentation. Uh, City Manager Hoffman, I don't know if I hit my 25 minutes, um, but if I, I came close enough. Um, so I don't know if you have anything else you want to add, otherwise we're ready for questions. Anything else? All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Romine. And Matt, what is your last name? Um, last name is Brandon. Brandon, okay. Thank you so much. Uh, we're not doing public comments. This is a study session, right? Council member comments are next. Who would like to? Council member Leslie. Thank you, guys. Matt, good job. That was nice. Um, Jeff, most of what Matt focused on was the already existing or in development spaces. Right, so he ha he knows what's available and what he can market. But my understanding is we're going to be moving beyond that, and maybe that's what you meant by the next session. So I'm just looking for clarity there about how do we know what else we need to build and where we would build it to continue the journey of attracting more commercial uh, to Broomfield. Uh, council member Leslie and members of council, absolutely. So as an example, um, and it was referenced in the earlier presentation, um, Baseline is gonna be one of those places. Um, we also know so there's some of the additional build outs in some other locations. But um, as we have mentioned before uh, many times, Broomfield's getting to that point where there's only so much land left. And so what we're trying to think through is, is both the 3.7 million square feet that Matt talked about tonight, but what is that next four or five million square feet? Um, the, the real key in all of this is thinking about the location of what we're trying to attract. Um, and so we think about it both, uh, and you know, you all know this about me, I'm a finance person uh, to some degree. So what I'm trying to think about is what's gonna pay our bills at the same time. Um, and so it is a mix of some commercials. So um, some uh, flex space is great, office space is great, but financially, quite frankly, retail strengthens us, as does dining. So finding those right locations and preserving them, for lack of better. Even if the market isn't there yet, as some of your questions were earlier, can we expand, could Center Street expand? What can we do on 120th? At the same time, one of the things, that it goes back to one of the first slides that I uh, shared with you, and that is, is the real property matters, but so does business personal property tax matter. And for what that means is, is oftentimes you'll hear us talk about, you know, a, a computer farm, a, a data storage facility. Those facilities are worth a lot of money from a tax perspective to us and the school districts because it's real and business personal property. It's not the building itself, it what, what goes on inside. So as Matt and I talk about these projects and think about what he needs for the next steps, that's what we're about. But we wanna do it in an orderly manner. So as an example, we know there's some spaces still in the northeast part of, of Broomfield. We wanna protect those. We want to think through, not just be transactional in interlocking and figure out what could be done today, but also reserving some of that space. Maybe our developers aren't, or the, built, the property owners may not be excited about that, but quite frankly, that is part of our role is to make sure that we have the wherewithal to go forward. And if, if a piece of property is great location for two things, Perhaps we want to reserve it for that higher value outcome. So that's part of what our conversation is, and we're asking you to understand part of that journey. But sometimes, and this is my words, I'm not going to say Jennifer has ever said this to me, sometimes you got to know when to say no. And sometimes that's the hardest part. And so saying no to a development that may be knocking on your front door, it's okay from a transactional standpoint, but it doesn't give you the greatest value. And that's what we're about right now, is trying to figure out that great value. Yeah, good. I hope that answers thank your you. question. Yes, you did. That's great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Council Member Cohen. Thank you, Mayor. Um, real quickly, uh, for Matt, welcome. I have two words for you. Trader Joe's. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
That's all I want. Do what you can. Um, I was interested in your chart where you talked about 1.2 million can commute to Broomfield. But I'm just curious if you could expand on that. Uh, we're not alone. So how do we stand? I know we had a conversation a couple months ago about us, how Broomfield stacks up relative to neighbors in terms of tax um, burden, and that we tend to be still a lower tax community than others. But in terms of the other factors out there, how do we stack up against whoever our com uh, competitor communities are? Sure. Um, so um, I guess to your first question about, you know, I guess just the labor force overall. So there's... Um, I think of things in terms of population, which, you know, we kind of know our population hovers around 75,000. There's the uh, workforce within Broomfield. So I think we saw just over 40,000 jobs that actually are physically located in Broomfield. And then when I think in terms of labor force, I, I use that term to describe the number of people who could commute to Broomfield from surrounding communities. So like within a reasonable 30 to 40 minute commute, um, what are, yeah, I guess what's the number of people that could come into Broomfield? So when I, when I use that 1.2 million number, that's roughly what it amounts to. Um, and that's just, you know, again, for a community of our size, um, we're competing against, you know, where I come from, Phoenix, Arizona, Salt Lake City, you know, bigger communities that, um, maybe have, you know, those bigger employment numbers, but we, we benefit from the region that we're in as well. We don't have to just, you know, except that we're small. We have, we have some really big resources. So that's why I like to highlight that number of labor force. I think it's, it can be pretty powerful. So, um, and then, uh, can you remind me your second question? I got talking on. Well, and just in terms of who you were up against in this region, oh. um, I guess where our weaknesses and you've already, you highlighted our strengths. Yeah. I don't know who our main competitors are and what you're up, up against. Sure. Sure. I think, um, so within the region, we, uh, we like to think of ourselves as, you know, collaborators and less competitors, right? I mean, in reality, you know, there are projects that say, hey, I'm looking at four cities in the Denver area, and you're one of them. So, you know, tell me about it. So we, we are competitors from that sense. I think I, I'll defer to um, Jeff for just the, you know, the specific community to community tax situation. I think he has a lot more experience there. But I can tell you um, just from our... Um, like some of our competitor communities out of state. Um, again, I, you know, you don't, maybe don't know a ton about me, but I come from the Phoenix area in Arizona and I lived close to Gilbert, which we've kind of identified as like, you know, a pretty comparable, uh, good competitor community. And I, uh, I would much rather work here doing what I do than Gilbert. Um, uh, when I, I say that workforce is the number one issue that we're asked about, I mean, it's, Literally, you know, sometimes it's the entire conversation. And what we're able to talk about with the skills that we have here with our existing employers, j even just in Broomfield alone, it's really impressive. So I, I think we stack up well nationally. And then, um, yeah, it's just a matter of, you know, finding the right fit in terms of the companies that we want to bring here. So um, specific to tax, I'll, I guess, leave it to Jeff. Yeah, and, and, and um, Council Member Cohen and, and members of Council, Part of this is, is recognize who your competition is or who we're parallel to. So we are more affordable perhaps in some other communities such as uh, some of the, the major cities that, that Brandon was talking or Matt was talking about, but also thinking about it within the, the local area. Um, you know, our real estate prices are lower than Boulder's as an example and lower than downtown Denver. Um, and really that's who we're competing against. So I would say within this marketplace, for the types of firms we oftentimes are attracting, we're up against Lone Tree, Greenwood Village, Denver, and Boulder. Um, when we think about national firms, and this is the key for us, is uh, Matt's already talked about that we're in a collaborative environment that we, where we really do our work, and that is, is you choose to come to one of the metro areas and then you find your location within it. And so in that sense, I think we're very competitive. The second part of it, and I always want to bring this back, and, and Matt has said it and I've said it, and that is, is this is about talent. And what you're talking about is, is if you're paying an employee, just for simplicity's sake, $100,000 a year, and, and let's say as an example, they don't like the area, and so therefore you have a high degree of vacancy, that's costing you twenty or $30,000 a year in vacancy costs, lost productivity, other things. It is not about a $30 a square foot price for the space that they have because 
for most employees, you're in a 100 square foot part of the building is what your work area is. At 30 bucks a square foot, that's $3,000. If you have a vacancy because it's not a great place for employees to want to be or to live and they can't figure out a way to be part of their family, that live-work relationship, it's not, it's not going to be the $3,000 that drives the equation or the property tax that drives the equation. It's very much about talent and the ability to retain talent. And that's really where I think Broomfield has done well. So when we do the dollars and cents, we have to think differently perhaps because we have to think about the way the firm thinks about it. And, and I can tell you at least for my last five years or ten years, and I suspect this is true for Matt, on the site selection visits, one of the most important person on that visit not from our standpoint, but from the company's standpoint, is the HR director. The HR directors, 20 years ago, never went in a site selection decision a visit. Nowadays, they are principal to it. And sometimes they will fly out separately and have a meeting with various companies to see can they get access to talent. So that's really what the emphasis has to be on, is access to talent and bringing forth the right kind of community. I hope that answers your question with a little bit more detail. Thank you. Council Member Lim? Uh, thank you. Um, related to the um, the fact that we have, uh, I think the staff has cited 1.2 million um, possible employees who could commute into Broomfield. So I guess this is, I just want some, some staff to comment on the fact that I mean, yes, we can have people commute in, but it runs in conflict somewhat with our other council priorities with sustainability um, because, you know, transportation is a big component of our greenhouse gas emissions in Broomfield. And we don't have multimodal transportation um, to come into Broomfield. So um, does this topic ever arise in your conversation with businesses that, you know, well, yes, we can draw employees from throughout the area, but gee, we'd like them to be able to not use their single oc occupancy vehicles to get here. Um, Council member Lim. Yes, it absolutely does. Um, I can remember one of my first conversations when I came to Broomfield was with the, with the co-CEO of partners group. And that was part of their choice when they decided to move from New York City um, eventually to Broomfield. They had a temporary uh, period of time where they were in downtown Denver while they were um, building out their site here. And part of it was, was the accessibility um, and thinking about the ability of their employees to live near work and not necessarily live a long way of work. So one of the things that we oftentimes think about from the work that we do is what I call workforce issues. And those workforce issues are not just access to workforce, as Matt was talking about, we can reach into 1.2 million. But the reality is, is for us to be for us to be successful going forward, we have three primary workforce issues that we oftentimes focus on from a business development standpoint. And that is, is quite frankly, education. Um, it's critical because we want to grow the talent or we want the talent to be able to grow in their career. And that means access to education. Secondly is access to housing. Um, and so you've oftentimes heard us talk about that. And then as you point out in your question, it's access to easy transportation systems. Broomfield is very rich in the sense of its, if it, of its transportation network for driving. It is not rich from the standpoint of its transportation system related to multimodal choice. That is a very important element to the next generation of workforce. And so we all need to make that commitment, and not just Broomfield, but us as a region. And those are the three things that we are working with with our partners, Matt and Rachel, um, who's our deputy director in our group, um, is working with our partner um, communities and our business development people. And those are three of the primary issues that we're working with collaboratively. And I would go a step further to say this isn't just a business development issue. This is something that the city manager's office has been focused on since long before I came here. When I, go through old, when I went through old files, what I saw was housing, transportation. I mean, it, I think Councilman Lindst, or Council Member Lindstedt said it earlier. Um, BRT started being worked on in 2005. I think it was. Um, I remember my first meeting up here was when I was with Dr. Cog, 
In 1998, I met with Kevin Stanbridge and, and uh, Charles, and we were talking about transportation issues then. So this is an ongoing issue, and, and I don't want to minimize education, but all three of these issues interplay to that workforce conversation. And yes, um, we wish more people could live and work in the same community or have short commutes. But the reality is, is the firms recognize if they're in San Francisco right now, a two-hour commute is nothing in San Francisco. A two-hour commute gets you to Vail. Um, and I don't know many people that are choosing to live in Vail and work in Broomfield, but there's probably some of Vail resorts that do, for all I know. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, it did. That's great. Thank you. Um, uh a question, another question I had actually related back to the baseline center district. Um, and so in their proposal, there was a hotel and the hotel was not counted in the commercial uh, as far as I could calculate um, in the square footage. So can you explain um, how the hotel factors into um our tax revenue in general and and or why it isn't wasn't counted in their baseline commercial um in their model that they provided or in their bond runs that they provided to us um back in 2020 and before they actually talked about uh, 100 180 room or 180 doors is the way they, or keys is the way it's often terms referred to in the, in the uh in that profession, um, is it, it was always in there. It's still in there. Um, we it is a commercial development, and so it's part of the all other category that I shared earlier. Um, most of the value actually comes from the hotel room itself, which has roughly forty to fifty thousand dollars of of what's called business personal property tax. Um, you, you know, it'll depend upon the scale of the room and things like that. But by the time they do it. Um, that includes their dining areas and other things. So it is on the commercial side, and we evaluate it that way, um, but it's not a separate category per se. Okay, thank you. Um, you uh, staff alluded to the progress of Flatiron Mall, and I had actually just looked at the Broomfield Voice to see there's a note. There was just an update on the Flatiron Mall. It says, while future applications are anticipated, late spring, early summer, 2022, there are no applications pending at this time. Does that statement signify there's a, a delay as far as what the staff anticipated with Flatirons Mall, or is it just like stating something for the public to keep up to date? Um, uh, council Member Lim and, and members of council, Mayor, um, Literally, while that was going on in the last conversation, Jennifer texted me and said, we would like an update from Flatiron or from Mace Ridge around the Flatirons. Uh, so Jacob, who's the lead um, person for them, um, is, was up here last week. Anna and I and, and a couple other people met with Jacob. They will be pulling demolition permits um, sometime in the roughly, Anna's still here, two months. I think they're pulling the permits. The goal is for them, as they have stated it, everything is on schedule as they anticipated. Um, they expect to have the demolition of certain buildings that is where this new area is going to be uh, completed um, and be kind of rewrapped, if you will, for lack of better, um, by November 1st. So they want to have that completed. What Jacob shared with us is they are anticipating beginning to pull permits and coming in for the for the next round of, of activities, but the SDP and others um, leading to pulling permits um, early in the in like February March of next year is when they're planning on coming in. So actually, there is no pending applications right now, but but in our conversation with Jacob on last Tuesday, which is or Wednesday, which is their lead person, everything is on schedule and they're anticipating moving forward. And they've had some preliminary conversations to start thinking about some of the lease space, um, as we shared. And there's more coming forward. So what um, uh, City Manager Hoffman asked me to do is ask them to come and make a short presentation on their status. Uh, we'll be looking for a time to be able to do that either with one of the other presentations just to give you all that quick update of where we are. So that project is both on time and moving forward in a rapid manner um, according to what we have heard. Okay, thank you. And I have two questions from the itinerant council member chef. Can we require concept reviews for residential and not commercial? I like getting commercial timelines sped up. 
Some communities are looking to establish themes like Adams County and the spaceport. Is it beneficial to focus on themes or continue to be more flexible with our approach? And if I could, Mayor, um, just to kind of respond to those two itinerant council members' questions or statements. Um, one is, is we have tended not to, or at least I professionally have tended not to pick themes or follow the market, if you will, but think about what's coming next. So as an example, Matt had um, earlier conversation today with what we think is the next generation computing um, and was part of a conversation on that. So we are thinking about space in the sense of who can occupy it and not necessarily being overly specific. On the, on the other question, um, that is something that both City Manager Hoffman as well as Ann and I have been in long conversations about is should there be two different processes, equitable processes, not necessarily anything, but that would set up a different timeline. So part of today's conversation as Matt represented was businesses look at a different timeline. They are thinking very hard about making a decision. Residents think about a different timeline. And so it very much is if you wanted to buy a home in Broomfield, you're probably thinking about what might be available in the next three to six months, which means the developer's already done a lot of that work. When we're talking about commercial space, it's a different timeline. And so I, I would at least go, on, go out on a limb and suggest that I think it makes sense. I think some other communities have done a very effective job, or, or at least I believe they've done an effective job, of making sure that they're equitable processes but I will stop there because it's really much more Anna's place, um, and she and, and Manager Hoffman have been in that conversation. I don't have the right answer, but I think it's something that we at least are talking about and looking at. Manager Hoffman, if you want to add. Councilmember Lynn, um, and via Councilmember Lynn, uh, Councilmember Schaff, uh, yes, yes, and yes. So when we come back, um, as, as I'm, I'm looking at Anna, we're all triangulating here between um, Mr. Romine and Anna and myself. Um, when, when we come back after um, finalizing uh, the bond, the debt conversation, the capacity conversation, um, the 2023 um, introduction to the budget and the utility rate study, we will come back to council with those, with those exactly those types of recommendations for council to consider. Um, again, like everything that we've discussed, we wanted to ensure that we had the staffing structure in place prior to making the recommendations. So if council gives a thumbs up to any one of those recommendations, we are ready to move. Um, so staffing is in place. We're excited to bring those recommendations. Um, um, I'm already getting calls. Council Member Lim, I had one today, actually, from residential is not tough to get. Um, they are uh, knocking down our doors daily. Um, and there's going to be those residential developments that are in the gray area. Those that came a year ago for concept reviews and those um, that, from a, that aren't in that pipeline yet. So um, it, will, it will bode well for us to have uh, clear and direct communications can't have that clear and direct communications until we have the recommendations solidified, have the conversation with council, and then we'll begin that, what that rollout looks like. Um, but an expedited process for commercial is uh, absolutely part of that. All right. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Any other questions from council? Comments? We have a big item yet to go. Okay. I just have one question after all these other ones. Um, how receptive are developers to the retail and commercial needs that you're seeing as you're out there chasing these projects? Because um, we keep hearing from developers that they're, the needs aren't as great as we think they are, and you're saying, oh, we need all these spaces. Like, is that feedback getting back to these developers? Um, and are they receptive and building those spaces? That's my only question. Um, so, council members, uh, yes, they are getting back. They see the market data that we see. We actually get it some, to some degree from them. Um, and so we try to understand what they're telling us and, and try to truth test it. Um, but that's part of the reason why a number of the projects like Lapore and Sims Technology, um, the, the two baseline tech spaces, all are coming forward because there, there is a market demand right now for that kind of space. I think your question, though, hints at also uh, as Councilmember Cohen had pointed out, 
Um, there is some demand and some interest by community members in certain types of retail and certain types of dining. Um, and part of that is getting the space available for that. So um, not necessarily the specific um, tenant or, or business that Council Member Cohen pointed out. Um, that's them bringing forward the space in certain ways. Um, but from the standpoint of sit-down restaurants and others, they have to be part of something. And so that's really what we're trying to figure out is, is how to make them part of something um, because that development has to be a little bit larger. It's hard to build a 3,000-square-foot restaurant here in Broomfield in and of itself, but it can be part of something that's a little bit larger, like a 100,000-square-foot development. So that's, that's how we're trying to figure out how to meet those needs, especially on the north side, but throughout. Um, and as, as um, City Manager Hoffman pointed out earlier, Arista was envisioned to have all of that. And what we're seeing, I think, um, and I could be wrong about this, but I believe they're opening three new restaurants within the next six months. And so we're finally getting to that ability uh, in Arista where things are really moving forward in a rapid manner because the market's now proven. Um, and that's a little bit of what Kyle was talking about too. Um, is once the market begins to get proven, then everybody wants to be there. And so that's, the, that's really our next step, is try to get somebody to take that first step up in the northeast side. Does that help? All right, thank you. That'll do it, good. Moving on. Thank you both very much, Mr. Brendan and Mr. Romine. Our final study session this item is regarding marijuana establishment licensing and potential changes to the Broomfield Municipal Code. Council has a copy of the agenda memorandum and I'll ask our staff to begin the discussion. Ms. Rogers, if you're not to the podium, five, four, three, <laughs> two, one. It's I'll okay. run. I'll just follow. Asleep. I'm motivated. Um, good late night, uh, Camarin Council members. Uh, Nancy Rogers, your city and county attorney. Here with me today is Joel Heine, assistant city and county attorney. In the galley tonight, we also have representatives from the clerk's office, from our selection committee, from police. Um, we also have input from sustainability, all the departments that have been impacted by the marijuana code. I'm gonna go through the slideshow pretty quickly for those council members listening remote. We did email this out so you can blow up, especially that map that we're gonna talk about. Um, so next slide. This has been going on for a while. Um, Broomfield passed a robust marijuana regulation uh, starting back in 2021. Um, with that robust marijuana regulations, council approved five licenses that will be issued. This is a heavily regulated industry, not only in Broomfield, but also in the state. Uh, Broomfield modeled their regulations off of Longmont with some twists that we'll talk about later on. Um, council also added in additional regulations, especially with regard to location, um, requirements for operations, and the number of licenses that were allowed. Please uh, jump in with any questions as we go because I am going to go through this slideshow quickly. Next slide. Um, in February 2022, uh, February 22nd, 2022, the lottery was conducted to pick the three applicants who met merit that would be getting potentially the three first three available license. The status of those, an update from the staff memo, all three applicants have received their conditional licenses. Two have submitted their construction plans through ComDev. These are not these are not turnkey operations. These businesses have to really build out to get ready to operate. Um, and at the time of the lottery, there were three alternates, just in case the three selected applicants, um, something happened, they couldn't open. Um, one of those has withdrawn, so as of right now, we have two applicants, alt alternates, ready to step in should any of the first three selected applicants not be able to open. Next slide. This map, um, given the land use restrictions in our code, shows all the available properties for marijuana establishment locations within Broomfield. Um, there's also a requirement in our code that you can only have one marijuana establishment on a certain road. So if you have, um, and if we can go to the next slide, if you have one on Midway, and as you'll see from that green 
triangle we do, the entirety of Midway, even if it's in red, is no longer available for a marijuana establishment. This map shows the location of the three selected applicants. Those are the green triangles. And then the two alternates, which are the green circles. That circle and triangle that are very close to each other, right under the B on Midway Boulevard, um, are within a thousand feet of each other. So should that green circle have to step in to claim one of the licenses, they would probably they would need to find an alternate location. So those are our current operations, those three triangles, those are the ones working to open right now. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joel. We have two types of edits to discuss with you tonight, proposed edits. The first one is those proposed by staff. And the second one are broader policy decisions that we'd really like council to discuss tonight. So Joel. All right. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. So starting with staff proposed changes, um, and let's go ahead and jump to the next slide. We can really break these down into four categories. Initially, we have clarifying um, the city clerk's role and duties, and that is relative to the city manager. There were certain um, tasks that made more sense based on issuing of licenses, for example, that um, staff felt might make more sense to be a city clerk role instead of a manager role. The next category is application issues and submission requirements. Um, those are really after going through the selection process, after seeing the applications coming through. Uh, staff's proposed changes regarding um, how to either reduce or reduce work or to clarify the application. Um, one of the big ones is to give the clerk discretion on imposing page limits on sections. Um, some of these applications were like six or seven hundred pages long. Um, one of them is also to specify and really to follow through with staff's interpretation of what a street is per our code. And as Ms. Rogers just indicated, as the code is written right now, and as staff understands it, once that one location on Midway opens, the entirety of Midway across the city is now out, um, cannot have a second location. The third major category, and let's go ahead and jump to the next slide, please are operational issues. Um, and this is, this is predominantly feedback from police and planning, um, but issues that we have discovered potentially to the operation of these businesses once they start, once they actually start sales. Um, that includes security. Um, there are concerns about storage of marijuana products, particularly when the store is not open, um, and whether or not those products should be allowed to be stored on the sales floor or if they do need to be removed from the sales floor. Um, there's also an, an, a clarification to stress the fact that for a sale, an ID needs to be checked twice. An ID needs to be checked once to enter the store and then a completely separate time to finish the sale. And then finally, the fourth category are really just clarifications and code cleanup. So updates, um, the state has actually moved its marijuana statutes three times in the past five years. And so this is just an update to, to change citations, to remove redundancies, and to combine um, provisions that we have um, found that were previously separated but would make sense to be simply combined at this point. So with those four categories, staff is simply seeking council's direction on those proposed changes. And all of those proposed changes are included in the proposed ordinance um, that was attached to the memo. So with that, I will turn this back to Ms. Rogers. Thank you, Joel. So those edits are what staff would propose if the policy structure of marijuana licensing didn't change. The next slide has a list of five questions and then sort of a six catch-all for some policy decisions that we want to discuss with council. Now that Broomfield has been through the original licensing process, we've gotten feedback about certain um, broader topics. One of them is the removal of the lottery. The lottery is a system that Broomfield has where um, applicants who meet merit, 
and are all determined to be potentially good operators are then selected at random. Um, this takes away the, uh, the selection committee having to decide who is number one, two, and three. The next one would be a change of that 1,000 foot setback or a change of the one establishment per street. Another might be um, the current code, when we passed it, the idea was to give out three licenses, see how it goes, and then give out two. But we all know that this has taken longer than we thought, and we know we still have at least six months before these marijuana establishments, as I mentioned, can build to suit, can get up and running. So um, we already have that natural gap of time, if you want to remove that gap, a one-year gap between the three license and the two. And related to that, do we want to go ahead and issue the two to any alternates that might be in the pipeline? As I mentioned right now, we have two alternates that are merit approved in the pipeline right now. Um, increase or decrease the number of licenses. When you limit licenses, you make them very, very competitive. We have five licenses in Broomfield that can go up or down um, on, on council selection. And uh, there was uh, an amendment when we originally passed the marijuana code related to signage and markings on marijuana establishment. And we've gotten feedback that that is challenging for our operators. And then any other changes that council would like to direct now that we have a chance to get the marijuana code before you. We're gonna keep that slide up. We're happy to put the map back up if any council member likes, and at that point, we'll turn it over to questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Rogers and Mr. Heine. So I guess to kind of expedite this, uh, let's do it in two rounds. With the first, in terms of the code changes, do you want direction on that first, or do we want to go through these five because that would impact the ordinance? Well, I actually think most of staff's changes will apply, staff's proposed changes, even if we do some of these tweaking. Um, what we would like to know is there is is there anything that staff proposed that was in the red line or in the slides that Joel went over that really gives you any concerns that you have any questions on? If not, we can definitely work within that to modify as needed, depending on the direction from this slide. So maybe we can bifurcate it that way. Yeah, I think that's okay. a good idea, Ms. Rogers. So on, can we go back to the first one then? So that's so slide six. Slide Jake. six. We'll do this first and. Um, Councilmember Lindstedt had his hand up first. So, Councilmember Lindstedt. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, on the on the, uh, the 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 code changes, I don't have a ton. Um, I did have a question about the uh, sales floor prohibition that was recommended from the PD. Um, didn't we, when we passed this, and I'm I'm sorry, I, I just uh, th thought this through up here. Um, we. We included a requirement that the 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 locks and the storage, you know, units or whatever they are on the sales floor are built into the facility, right? That was a that was a, that was a requirement. So if they were going to leave things on the sales floor, they had to have security or vaults or uh, pull down doors or lockers. That was that was already included. I, I thought uh, Councilmember Lem um, actually ran an amendment uh, when we first passed these to require it to be built into the facility. Um, so I was just wondering what the how this that that rule and this related. So. I'll let Joel answer that one. And I can move on to other stuff if if that's. No, you, council member, you are ab absolutely correct. The code does require um, that safes or vaults must be incorporated into the building structure, or secured to the structure in such manner as to prevent removal. Um, with discussion with the police, and we do have um, a couple of representatives here tonight to, to further discuss this if you wish, um, their concern is that while that is one level of security, mm -hmm. there's an additional level of security by requiring the product to be removed from the sales floor and put into a, a I guess what you would call a more secure room Other than room. just the sales floor. Okay, I mean, so I guess my, my I don't think we need to go for, further into it. It's kind of a minor thing. Um, you know, I think I think I, I think that change is fine, um, but in the case where someone maybe invests a lot into a vault, or I mean, there needs to be some wiggle room there, right? Like, I don't know the, how these sales floors—they're not all going to be the same. People will have different security measures. I mean, if someone literally put a vault on their sales floor, 
I don't know that requiring them to move it into a back room is really adding a whole lot to the, that just seems pretty onerous. So <laughs> that would be my, my only, my only uh, thoughts would be to, to and, and make sure that there's some flexibility in that rule um, if we do go forward with that code change. The rest of them um, make total sense. Um, can we go back to the map? Which map would you like? The, with the triangles and the circles. The, the close-in map? Yeah. Five. Of the locations we that were proposed and accepted. Um, so kind of philosophically, um, when we passed these rules, um, we, we made all these decisions based on the, the larger map that had all of those parcels up north. And what I think we didn't, we didn't really understand or, or realize is that in those northern parcels that were available to use, there weren't really any buildings available to lease. So we ended up in a scenario where um, all of the marijuana stores have been located on the south part of town in about the same part of town. Um, and I don't think that this was this body's intent necessarily to have five um, stores all in the same part of the city and county. Um, I thought that the intent was, you know, hopefully they would be more spread out than this. I mean, we can literally fit the entire map uh, south of Miramonte. So that's, I mean, that, that, I, that's, that's concerning to me um, because I don't think that was what we intended to do. Um, so I, I don't support um, adding the two uh, shops on the wait list um, because I think we need to go back and, and change some of our setbacks and rules to try to get some diversity of locations so that all of our marijuana stores aren't just competing with each other. Um, because right now we're going to have a lot of inner competition and our residents that live in the northern part of the community are still just going to go to Lafayette. So I... I, I don't I don't think this this quite hit the intent of, of what we were looking for if we took those circles and turned them into triangles and had all of the stores in the same uh, part of town um, I don't know how to fix that you know the one street prohibition isn't even really that problem um, I think the problem is our residential setback is is huge I mean it's 250 feet um, so I would like to see us adjust that residential setback. Um, lower it or remove it. Um, to my council colleagues who may be concerned about that, remember liquor stores do not have a setback. So um, just, just something to keep in mind, but um, I think we fell a little bit short by having all of these proposed uh, stores all on, in such a southern part of town. Um, and I think it's going to put all of our marijuana stores at a disadvantage if we keep them clumped together in this way. So I would support keeping them in two phases, um, move forward with the three that are proposed, and then have another three in a separate process later on. Um, and we review our, our, our setbacks um, and land use requirements for those to try to get a little bit more diversity of location. Um, I would also be supportive of adding one more license so that it's three and three. I have always thought three and two is strange. Um, three and three, I think, is more balanced, more fair. Um, and I don't, I don't really see a negative to it. Um, so that would just be my personal preference. Um, in terms of the lottery, I was opposed to the lottery to begin with. I, I'm still opposed to it, but that's what we move forward with. And it's, you know, I don't feel it's, it's not a priority of mine to remove it at this point. Um, but getting a diversity of locations is absolutely a priority. Um, could you go back to the last slide? I want to make sure I'm not missing anything. Oh, I would definitely remove the prohibition on green cross markings. Um, dispensaries uh, order products sometimes, and they come with markings and suggested signs, and I can see how that is completely onerous um, and unnecessary. So I, I definitely support the removal of that. Of that. Um, and with the street rule, um, maybe I, I would be totally, I, I voted against adding that rule, but maybe we just need a limit on the distance. Um, that could be a solution. But again, that's not really the, the, the reason we don't have diversity of, of, of locations of these stores in my mind. So I'm, I don't feel that strongly about it. Um, so I think, I think that's everything. I know I covered a lot of ground there. Um, so I think I'll, I'll let others speak and, and maybe I'll chime in again. But those are, those are my overall thoughts and kind of criticisms of how this first round has worked out. So thank you, Mayor. Thank, thank you, you Council Member. Madam Mayor, yes. as we move forward, if other council members could let us know their thoughts on 
changing the residential setback, lowering that, and their thoughts on adding that third license. That would be helpful, just so we don't have to circle back after each one. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all got that? <coughs> so the residential setback and the additional license and what was the third thing? What was that? Yeah, the marketing's already on there. The what? Uh, yeah, it was marketing a, setback and a sixth license. Yeah, and a sixth but marketing's on there. Okay, Council Member Ward. Thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, yes, going off uh, what Council Member Lindstedt said, um, I do have a question as to why we set our limit at five. Um, I was not on Council at the time those decisions were made, so I don't know the history of it. We were going to model ours after Longmont in the in the beginning, and they had four licenses. They capped it at four. And then during our deliberations, we broke it up, and um, it was proposed, I think, on the dais to, to do three and then two. That's how it grew. Just like that. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, well, I am in total support of adding another um, license perfectly fine with me i do agree with councilman merlinstadt that um the concentration of marijuana stores is um too much to the south and not not enough to the north um and uh with regard to the setbacks i'm in total agreement with lowering that setback um Regarding the PD's uh, issues about oh, operations and storing things off location, um, are there any other establishments like liquor stores or tobacco stores that have this particular requirement to store products when um, off uh, the store floor when they're not open? No. Then I, I I don't understand why they have, want that particular requirement then, because um, I would treat marijuana kind of pretty much like the same I would alcohol and tobacco products. Um, otherwise, all the clarification code cleanup stuff perfectly fine with me. I didn't have any particular issues with the language changes or if anything wanna, like that. If you want to hold on one second, Council Member Ward, um, would you like to address something? Yes, that Mayor said? and Council Members. Uh, my name is Billy Joe Naismith. I'm a detective with the police department. Um, formerly worked several years with the Marijuana Enforcement Division. And this particular topic is specific to marijuana stores um, because of the high volume of very large scale and very damaging burglaries that are um, very possible and likely with marijuana businesses. And we just don't see those with liquor or tobacco establishments. Um, the con the also, the concern is the fact that marijuana is still federally illegal and a, a very large portion of our responsibility as regulators and law enforcement is to ensure the safety and security of that product, um, not only for diversion um, through burglaries or illegal activity, but also access to minors. And for those reasons, the security of the product and being removed from the sales floor is an industry standard. And many of the other local jurisdictions in the metro area have that same requirement. Thank you so much. You got that, Thank Council Member? That. Yes, I did. Thank you. Um, I mean, with that being said, I still, maybe it's just because of my age, <laughs> um, I have a different view on it. But if that's something that we need to do, um, I think like what Councilmember Lindstedt said, as long as it's, I guess, some flexibility, if they already have a built-in safe on the floor, can that be factored in? Perfectly fine with that. Um, I don't know what was the f other few issues. Um, I'm not really sure I have a full opinion on the lottery system. Um, 
I, has it been working somewhat well? Define well. <laughs> I'm not even sure I know how to. Well, so, let, let's see. When did, <laughs> when did the moratorium sunset? Let's go from there. If, um, when did the moratorium sunset in May? Well, in August, because that's when we had to issue the... Originally, it was we February, passed in March. Though. We passed the ordinance in March. Um, so... Um, extended it twice. We, ex- we extended it twice to pass the, the code amendment that addressed the lottery issue that we got sued over, which was that people tried to load up the lottery by submitting duplicative applications. Well, actually, I'm going way back to when the 2020 February, when the moratorium was going to sunset, and we decided to let it sunset. And the staff asked for two extensions on that. So it's taken a couple of years now to get to where we are now, Mm -hmm. due to, in my opinion, people trying to reinvent a perfectly good wheel um, so that's what we're trying to avoid, Council Member Ward. Let's just do what's been working. And Longmont didn't have a lottery. And they didn't have delays because of the lawsuits and because of having to redo their code. So that's the mayor's opinion. We tried it that way. And it didn't get it to where we need to go any faster. So, so I will jump in with an alternative view because we have three lawsuits one was due to the lottery and the loading up of applications, but two was due to challenging the merit committee's, um, so the selection committee's merit determination. So if we were to remove the lottery, we still would have had those other two lawsuits because the selection committee would have just determined who got the license rather than pulling them out. So, so the removal of the lottery isn't gonna, isn't gonna make it certain that we'll never get sued again. Uh, the reason for the lottery, just some background why the lottery was was advocated for by staff is because um, where marijuana is in Colorado, we have a lot of really good operators. Um, uh, come, and that's what we saw in the applicants that, uh, that Broomfield got. Um, and those applicators all meet merit, that they all can operate successful stores in the community. Um, some of these applicants have a ton of resources to hire architects and graphic designers to make their applications look great, and they meet merit. We also had some smaller applicants who were able to also meet merit, but didn't look as fancy and as flashy. They all have equal opportunities in the lottery. That was the goal of the lottery. But I, I, will, I will acknowledge what the mayor is saying. The lottery does come with issues. I mean, it was, it's another step in what is already a long, heavily regulated process. Thank you, Ms. Rogers. Thank you. All right, Council Member Ward, did you get through your list? Um, I have one more thing that I wanted to um, and talk about. Maybe this isn't the right time or place to bring it up so please let me know if this is correct um but with regard to where we um send funds from the marijuana tax um could a portion of those uh funds be moved to the affordable housing um or inclusionary housing ordinance fund for our new um affordable housing authority Maybe just something to think about. I don't think anything's going to happen tonight, but I'm not sure if that's something we could do or if this is within the purview of this particular subject. Council Member Ward, this is more the licensing code, the code that regulates these businesses, the determination of where to put these tax, which I believe just go into the general fund right now. Um, no. Oh. For the, they are, the, thank you, thank you. They are earmarked already, so a change in that would actually be a separate discussion from this, how we regulate the businesses. Okay, just. Yeah, thank you. Was, wasn't entirely sure, but I thought I'd throw it out there just in case. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I'm done. Thank you. All right, thank you. Council Member Cohen. Thank you, Mayor. Um, on the five, I support the lottery. It seems like the most fair process considering what you just noted. They're all pretty much the same. Um, 
I would support the modification of eliminate the street requirement, the one street elimination or limitation. I would support removing the gap. I would support increasing the number of licenses to five or more. I don't think it's, I think we just need to match what we do for other businesses like liquor stores, which actually contribute to more societal damage than marijuana stores. I'd support removing the prohibition on green crosses. Marijuana does have a medicinal purpose for some people. Um, I agree also with the um, proposals the staff has recommended. Um, I think we're overly regulating this industry after 10 years and having unintended consequences such as um, creating a concentration in stores in one area of town. So I think, I think as Council Member Ward referenced, um, you know, I don't think any other industry is regulated to this level. Uh, we certainly should match whatever liquor stores are regulated at. And I recognize they are experiencing issues with burglary that's largely self-inflicted because of the banking rules and the fact it's still illegal federally, but hopefully that will be resolved shortly. That's it. Thank you so much. Everyone else, be like Councilmember Cohen. You can do it. You can do this in 30 seconds. I Council believe Member in Cohen you. Councilmember Cohen wants to go home. So. Yes, me too. All right, next is Councilmember Marshalshen. Thank you, Mayor. I'm also going to keep myself brief. One question for staff. Um, do we currently have a radius uh, on liquor stores between what they can be in between each other? Um, between liquor stores, yes. So uh, retail liquor or liquor licensed drug stores, which is how grocery stores are usually licensed, um, they have a 1,500-foot setback or bubble around them. Okay. Thank you. So as Councilman Cohen and Ward said, um, I do also support – I believe that this should be um, – we shouldn't be regulating these any different than we do liquor stores. Um, so uh, to that regards, um, on the staff changes, I have no problems with most of them. I do have a problem with the security one. Um, I'm going to oppose that one. Um, I don't believe it's necessary. I think it's onerous to the businesses to have to move all the product when they're already locking it up in secure locations on the floor. Um, as far as the five goes, I believe we should remove the lottery. Um, I believe we should remove the one establishment per street mod thing. I think that it should go to the radius that we do for liquor stores. Um, along those lines, the setbacks, I think the setbacks from residential, et cetera, should be the same as liquor stores also. Um, the gap year, I, I'm going to get to that one in a second. Um, I do recognize Council Member Lindstedt's point uh, about there's none up, up north and they're all concentrated. So I, I, I have concerns about just giving those to, to those two alternates right now. Um, along those lines, the number of licenses, I believe that sh we should not have a limit on the number of licenses. I think the, part of the problem with the, with the lottery as well as every, the concentration is the fact that we are artificially limiting the market. Um, and if we just don't have a limit on it, then the market will decide where they're going to be um, along those setbacks and the um, – you know, the radius thing. Um, also, the, the question about the comment about, um, you know, we have, you know, the big, the big boys that can, you know, they can afford the, the fancy things and the smaller operators that you know, do away with the license required, the number of licenses, and you're going to be able to have more mom and pop type of establishments come in. Um, I do support removing the sign, the green cross sign. And then number six, other possible changes, I think we should re-examine whether or not we allow cultivation in Broomfield. So that is all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Council Member Hinkle. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so going to operational issues with uh, the police, the PD, I really do feel like if they're going to be the ones responsible for making sure that everything is... Um, you know, safe and secure during these times that we have right now where it's not federally approved. Um, you know, we're not the one facing these consequences and having to clean up the mess. So I, I really think we need to really trust our PD in this. Uh, and a lot of places actually do do that. We, we did a, a, you know, a walk in one place in Denver and they already put them in a secure room when the store is closed. So it's something that they're that they're used to, that these businesses are used to. Um, I am okay with removal of the lottery. Of course, I was never okay with the lottery to begin with. I felt like it was sort of an added hassle to, to a selection committee that we already had. 
Um, I never liked the the one establishment per street just because what that did is it just eliminated it on one street. It didn't eliminate it, you know, within a certain area. So you could have four places in one area and they're all on separate streets. So, and that, um, the modification to, to the setbacks, uh, for, I would like to eliminate the residential setbacks. And I think that's why we're not seeing it more North on, on in my ward. And, and I remember fighting this quite heavily, um, because we don't, we don't have that with liquor stores. And so that was one of the main reasons why we couldn't have it in ward five is because that we had those residential setbacks, which I think were pretty arbitrary. Um, one year gap we can remove that that's fine um increase or decrease uh, i'm okay with six for right now um removal uh on the prohibition that's fine too i'm i'm kind of on the fence about that one unless someone else has any sort of you know thoughts on that i would say that if we can make it easier for the the companies to do what they've been doing and doing it well then we shouldn't get in the way of that um and i believe that is about it was there anything i was else i was missing did we add anything else to that list to, do you want to clear hold on council member hinkle yeah sure. if i can just clarify one of the comments that that you had um made and it, and it does involve the setbacks and it sort of sounded to me like <clears throat> when you're talking about removing the street rule that I, I just want to make clear that, that you understand, as the code is right now, there is a 1,000-foot setback between um, stores. So, for example, the, with the street rule, you couldn't, in theory, have four on an intersection, even if they all had different street addresses. Well, even then, we could have a high concentration in that one area. They could be 1,000 feet apart, but you would still you know, have a high concentration, you know, just because they're on separate streets. I don't know. Um, we need to find some sort of answer to the, the the equity issues of having all of these stores in certain places in Broomfield. Uh, we know that our land use right now really prohibits a lot of our marijuana being, you know, put in, in places where we need it. Um, we have families up north up here that need it. So we just need to make sure that we're very cognizant of that. Um, I don't mind the, the thousand foot setback from each other, but just the street name, it really added, you know, a ton of setbacks just, you know, because of street name. It just didn't make any sense to me at the time, and it still doesn't. Okay. I think that's about it. Yes, no, thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Thank you both. <laughs> thank you. All right. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I guess I'll start quickly that I am okay with all the changes that were proposed by our, our city attorney, so I have, I have no issues there. Um, I'm going to express a, a bit of a frustration that we're having some of this discussion right now uh, with some of the other issues because we just passed a, a whole bunch, you know, we passed these regulations, I believe it was less than a year ago, and I feel like we're sort of, to, to, to at least for, for some of these, we're putting the the cart before the horse. I mean, we we haven't even seen the first uh, establishment open up yet, and we're and we're talking about making changes to, to to things that we don't know how they're going to go. We don't know if changes are needed. Maybe they will be needed. Maybe they won't be needed. Um, but we don't know. We we haven't seen anything. So I'm I'm not sure why we are are, are having the discussion on, on some of these issues. Um, but but having said that, I. We'll just address a few of them. The the lottery is not a big deal to me, really, one way or the other. I, although I do see the the merits of the lottery system. I, as my understanding, our our, our grading is you know it's, it's not so granular that there's going to be a, a big difference between applicants, and and having the lottery allows our our, our staff to, to 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 have a a selection process that, that that's fair and unbiased and if, if we have this uh, if it's just a uh, uh without the lottery it's my understanding staff's going to be required to to pick and choose a favorite and, and i don't think we want to put them in that position and i don't think that's fair to the applicants so unless we have a system that's so graduate granular that we're going to really make a determination between applicants um then I, I think the lottery system is the only way to have a fair process um, beyond that the I'm, I'm willing to have discussions on things like the, the setbacks, I am in favor of, of diversifying the locations of our 
of, of our uh, establishments. Uh, I think those were, were good points. Uh, so I'm open to the conversations. I can't say, you know, yes or no on, on, a, on a lot of those things, but I am open to having these conversations to, to figure out how to diversify it more. And again, my, my concern from the beginning was, you know, we have certain areas of our community that are sort of gateways, and I want to be able to to control those gateways. And if we could uh, figure out how to do that, I'd be willing to have conversations on on setbacks and and some of the other minute issues that are that are being brought up. Even though I can, we haven't even had an establishment open. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Botem. And to clarify for those who weren't around when this whole thing happened, it was before we had our amendment rule. And I think it's when we decided to have the amendment rule because many of these stipulations were just thought up on the dais with no vetting and no conversation and no research. So I think what we're seeing with feedback from the operators that have applied that a lot of these are onerous and cumbersome and looking at the map, it did not create much diversity in where they are. And some of these things are having detrimental effects already, even before the operators have been licensed. So I remember that night, um, and I think we said we were going to revisit this a year later, and that's what Ms. Rogers did. She brought it forward with Mr. Heine so that we can um, tweak it. And I, I think it needs it, as as you've heard from our attorneys. So moving on to Councilmember Lim. Uh, yes. Um, one of the staff changes on page 12G, um, there is something that was struck by the staff where um, it was an exception where the applicant, if they had had a marijuana license suspended, that was a disqualifying factor. That's what I understood. And that was struck through by the staff. Why was that eliminated? Um, so that was struck through out of that section and instead that um, <clears throat> issue, if you will, was actually added to the definitions of, of for cause uh, licensure removal. So all, all that did is actually that moved to um, from that section to section 542030. It is on page two. It's subsection um, 6E on page two. Okay, great. I missed that. Thank you. Um, um, the s discussion with the lower residential or getting rid of rid of the residential setback. Um, I I am interested in looking at the issue of of trying diver to diversify the locations, but I'm not sure. I'm I'm well. I am hesitant about getting rid of the residential setback, and and that applies whether the residential setback is from residences in the south or residences in the north or any area of the city. And and what gives me pause with that is what the police just said. Um, so the police claim currently um, that there are more burglaries with marijuana stores than liquor stores or tobacco stores or whatever. So if that's the case, if that is the current reality, then I'm hesitant to want to get rid of the residential setback of 250 feet. So I'm, those are my thoughts for now. And as we go forward with other possibilities of how to um, achieve greater diversity, diversity of locations. Um, I'm fine with removing the lottery. That's number one. Um, number two, um, that's fine. If we want to, we, I, I think they should be a distance apart at least, um, 1, 1,500, like the liquor store or something. Um, and uh, I think we should keep our current, keep with our current goal of, uh, testing how three go first and then going with two more with the, the five. Um, I'm fine with removing the removing the prohibition of the having the crosses. 
on the building. Um, so, yep, I think those are my answers for now. Um, Council Member Schaaf is fine with removing the lottery. He does not want to increase licenses beyond five at this time. He wants to add the two next businesses so, uh, sooner than we have done with the first three. And yes, those are his thoughts. Thank you. I appreciate that uh, from Council Member Schaff, uh, Council Member Lim. Thank you. Council Member Anderson. Thanks. Um, okay, I'll keep it short too. Um, for the security and all the other staff recommendations, I accept those. I very much appreciate the police department's input. Um, and I, I thought we had covered that very well in the first go round, but um, with security is a, a top concern. Um, I want to follow our staff's recommendation and keep the lottery um, that was put in place for a reason. On the 1,000 foot setback around establishments or one per street, I think I, if I recall correctly, we did not want a section of Broomfield to become known as Marijuana Row where you had multiple establishments. So I'm okay um, modifying something you know, in there, but just, just making sure that we, we don't allow multiple marijuana establishments to stack up in one, one row in one area. Uh, the one year, uh, one year gap. I'm, I'm okay maintaining the current process and just finishing it through and, and making sure all is well. Um, and, and I do have one concern on that one. If we were to give the next two um, licenses to the two merit approved alternates, would that result in a lawsuit? Because others might say, you know, we were going to apply in that next round. So I, I'm just I feel like we're fraught with lawsuits in this area. Yeah, and I, I think the industry, this area is fraught with lawsuits because of the limited licenses, but we would not, without going into the detail as to why, and I can provide that separately, we would not have proposed that idea for council if we thought it would be open to a lot of challenges. We think that's a viable idea. Okay, and then I, I'm, op I'm open on that one, on, on how we proceed there. Um, and I would keep the five licenses for now. I, I, I do hear what you're saying that we, it, it causes a, that might be a portion of the lawsuits, but also there was, there were many residents in Broomfield that weighed in with concerns, including um, the Adams 12 school district with the more availability there's for marijuana, the more accessible it becomes and the more um, our youth have an issue with it. So I, I'm not, not in favor of increasing those. Um, on the green cross signs, um, that, that would only be, it would be a green cross. It could never be like a red cross or some other color. It would have to be green. Is that correct? The, the, the cross the would have to be. Prohibition. The prohibition was on green. If, the if current prohibition is anything that is green or has any medical, in, could be interpreted to be medical. Okay. I, I guess I'm not so sure. Unless there's something else that has um, significance. As if the green cross is representing something um, of other significance. But if it's just, if it's typically used for marijuana, then... Yeah. It would make sense to allow it to be used for marijuana, or for medical marijuana, I guess that is. Um, and then the residential setbacks. This is one where I, I will not, I do not want to budge on this. I want to keep the 250 foot setback. Oh, there's so many people up here who talk about unintended consequences. A lot of thought and effort went into that. Um, we looked at maps. We looked at a, a lot of factors, and the previous council determined that we wanted to have the 250 foot setback. So without an in-depth discussion, again, I, we really do need to keep the 250 feet. Um, and there are cer certain areas, I'm thinking one that was super controversial was an area on the north side of Anthem Ranch. If we remove the 250 foot setback, um, the Anthem, it, that becomes a, a one of the main locations up on the north side is right nestled up against the Anthem Ranch residents in that little clinic. And, and that was a, a huge concern. Um, Can we just get to the answers? And oh, sure. Your, yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and then <laughs> that's the last, it's really the second last question. It's really not taking that long. Okay. Sorry. Um, okay. Um, it's an important, important discussion. And there is concern in Ward 4 over marijuana. And that might be why some of these licenses were not in that area. Um, it's mostly residential. And... Um, and I'm just, I'm, the, the, the other situation with the 250 foot setback, I appreciate Councilmember Lim's um, concern over the um, burglaries, 
But there are areas on the north side of Broomfield baseline, I forget what the word was that um, our city manager used. It was a, they have a, there will be no marijuana sales in baseline. It's, there was a term used for that. And then um, there's also on the north side, it's mostly class A retail that's going in. There, there's not a lot of places to, um, to rent. So these are all new, these are all new facilities going in. So it's not likely to diversify because we decrease the setback. And that is all I have. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Anderson. Council Member Leslie. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, just on the Green Cross thing, just so I understand it better, there's a prohibition currently on using that as a sign for a marijuana store, right? Correct. Okay, thank you. So I'm, I agree with um, uh, Mayor Pro Tem's comments about the lottery. I think he phrased that very well. Um, I agree with um, Council Member Linstead's comments about the distribution of the um, shops uh, throughout the area rather than clustered. However that gets phrased, I also agree with the setbacks. Um, the one-year gap is not an issue for me. Um, I think staying at five is appropriate. I don't want to see this become, you know, on every corner. Um, I'm fine with removing the prohibition on the green uh, cross signs. Councilmember Leslie, I'm sorry. Can I get clarification from you on your your position on the um, buffers or the setbacks? You said yeah, I'm saying keep the setback. Thank you. Um, but I also agree with uh, Councilmember Lister's comments about the distribution of the shops. Okay. So I don't care about the one street thing. I'm more interested in being distributed across the county rather than like a bazaar, everything all in one place. Thank you. I lost my Zoom. I got kicked off, so I'm just trying to re-log on because I just got booted. So here I go. I don't know who else <laughs> might have their hand raised. Oh, okay. Well, that I've been trying to re-log on. That's everybody. On. Uh, that is, that is everyone? Me. Everyone but you, madam. Oh, okay. Well, I, you can remove the lottery if you need my opinion. And with the setbacks, it's funny. When I was on LLA, the people who were applying for liquor licenses with convenience stores, they had to hire a company to do surveys instead of setbacks, right? They still do that, right? They do a certain radius survey to determine if there's any opposition to this liquor being sold. Why can't that be implemented for this instead of a setback? Do you want to talk about that? Sure. Yeah. You know, it could. For liquor, there's a specific burden, and that's whether or not that liquor store will meet the needs and desires of the adult residents in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so that's specifically why they do that survey. So if uh, Broomfield were to have a code, pro code provision establishing that as the burden um, for the licenses, that could happen. I don't know if I want that to happen, but I just wondered if that's how they get around the setback because of the survey. I would say that would be one way to to definitely get around the setback, right? You've established that this neighborhood is okay with this business being there. Okay. We're not going to litigate that tonight, but just an idea. Um, the one-year gap, hey, it, it happened. It, it came and went. So I think knowing that there's a, another amount of time additionally still before these will ever generate any revenue, two years since we let the moratorium sunset, I think the time has been served and we should just move along. And, and I do support six um, total, so three in the second round. Um, yeah, definitely get rid of the green crosses. The reason being, this was not vetted with any of our operators before it was uh, produced on the fly. And many of, many of the operators use that in their branding, in their marketing materials. So they would have to change all of their copyrighted information and their signage and their printed materials. So that's one of those things where you kind of want to check with, you know, the people actually impacted by this before imposing a regulation. Um, and definitely, uh, yeah, I don't think we need the residential setback. 
and the one per street. You can see that what you're trying to avoid is having a cannabis store row was created in essence because of the over-regulation that happened in the first round, um, in my opinion. Is that all? And I support all of the things that our attorney's office has recommended in the code. That is all, and I just want to give a shout out to everybody on staff who worked on this. I mean, it really, we got so much input by a lot of great subject matter experts. Um, so uh, thank you for helping Joel and I out. It definitely wasn't just the attorney's office. Uh, we will go back and prepare an ordinance for first reading that we'll bring back. We will do our best to try to hit consensus, but this is, the mayor was correct, this is why we imposed the amendment process. It, it definitely was. So um, you can utilize that and we can have a really good debate when this matter comes for first reading. If there are any questions in the meantime, please feel free to reach out. But I think we have everything we need tonight. Thank you so much, Ms. Rogers and Mr. Heine and the entire team for sitting it out with us, the clerk's office, Jason, planning, finance, economic vitality, Jake, and our wonderful CMO team. That concludes the agenda items for this evening's study session. There being no further business, the study session is adjourned. Thank you.